All right. And I, I don't think we did the to open to open session. We didn't do that. I mean, so moved by Councillor Elliott, second by Deputy Mayor Turton, that the Council of the Town of Middle resumes into open council. Anybody opposed? That is carried. Thanks, everybody. Um, just before we get into the actual meeting, I just want to say, and I'm sure everybody has the same thoughts of our and our concerns for our Ukrainian friends that are over there in, in Ukraine and suffering through what has got to be a really tough situation. So I, our hearts go out to it. I, as from an FCM standpoint, we have we had a great relationship with Ukraine. We do a lot of work with them through the cities, um, and we've had people there and we pulled them out, obviously, but. Uh, um, Yes, it's 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 something that I've I've met some people from Ukraine. They're very nice people, actually. Um, so I've, our thoughts go out and our prayers to them that hopefully that gets over with sooner than later. Okay, uh, just want to move into a move by Councillor Gutson, second by Councillor McKenzie, that minutes of the Town of Minto January 18th closed session meeting of, and the February 15th regular council meeting be approved. Anybody opposed? That is carried. Additional items, I have one. Has anybody else got any? If not, just hit me when you get there. Ron? Okay. Moved by Councillor Anderson, second by Councillor Elliott. The Town of Minto Council convenes in the Committee of Adjustments. Anybody opposed? That is carried. And uh, I will call the public hearing to order and state any decision reached by this committee today cannot be used to set a precedent. Each application considered by the committee is dealt on with its own merits to not two and two no two applications are exactly the same i will state the public hearings to consider the minor variance application mv 2022-05 framark development company limited harding uh and i'll call secretary treasurer mcrob to state the following go ahead Emily. thank you mayor bridge the property subject to the proposed minor variance application is legally described as part park lot 17 south side margaret Register plan 61R6234, parts one to six, in the former town of Harriston, municipally known as 99 Arthur Street West, in the town of Mento with frontage on both Arthur Street West and Brock Street. The, prop, the subject property is plus or minus 1.37 acres or plus or minus 0.55 hectares in size. The purpose and effect of the application is to permit the construction of four land lease, single detached senior dwellings with reduced exterior side yard setbacks and two land lease single detached senior dwellings with reduced rear yard setbacks. The applicant is seeking relief from section 35.28B4 and section 35.28C5 of the Town of Minto's Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw 0186 as amended. Section 35.28B4 states that the minimum exterior side yard setback adjacent to Arthur Street and Brock Street is 4.5 meters, 14.7 feet, whereas 2.93 meters or 9.6 feet is proposed for four dwellings. Section 35.28C5 states that the minimum rear yard setback is 5 meters or 16.5 feet, whereas 2.93 meters or 9.6 feet is proposed to the covered rear porch. Additional relief may be considered at this meeting. The notices were mailed to the property owners within 200 feet or 660 meters of the subject property, as well as the applicable agencies, and posted on the subject property on February 18th, 2022. Reports have been received for you to view. And that's from our planning technician for the town of Mento and the planner for the Wellington of County. Uh, we have no registered speakers to speak at this meeting other than the owner. Thanks, Annaline. And I'll turn it over to Ashley to give us our town report. Go ahead, Ashley. All right. Uh, so good afternoon, Chair Bridge and members of the committee. So this minor variance, as Annaline mentioned, is for 99 Arthur Street West, where there are 16 land lease single detached senior dwellings proposed. Um, and that's currently being developed by Mark Harding. The developer currently has three units occupied, two more under constructed and or under construction and interested purchasers in additional lots. Since the approval of the original plan from 2000, the developer has seen an increased demand in the home layout and of the constructed and occupied units and is seeking a minor variance to be able to build the same style of home on the remaining lots. To do this, relief is required from the exterior side yard setback and from the uh, rear yard setback to the covered porch on two lots. County and MBCA staff are satisfied that the application is minor and don't have concerns. Town staff recognize the development is dynamic and that the existing plan approved from 2000 does not necessarily meet the demands of today's market. We do believe that the intent and purpose of the official plan and zoning bylaw are being maintained, and we recognize the demand for senior housing in the area. 
We're also recommending that with the required buffering and privacy fence that's already mandatory in the existing zoning, um, that a condition be placed on the minor variance, that it be a board on board fence to help increase privacy and reduce any sound. Um, so, but we are recommending the approval of this request with the recommended condition. Thank you, Ashley. And uh, before I get any questions, I'll maybe ask Mark, did you want to speak to this, Mark? Or I see you're there, so you stepped on mute yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Mark. Good. I don't know what happened to the video. I don't have the same IT help that I had last time. So. <laughs> no problem, Mark. You uh, don't have to look at me. That's good. Do you have anything to add to, to this? I mean, I, I think Ashley did a pretty good job, but. Yeah, she uh, explained everything that we're thinking. Like, um, it's just a matter of uh, needing relief from that 14 feet, seven inches uh, by about five feet approximately and uh, five foot two to. So we're saying we reduce it down to nine foot six, which would allow us to put that same floor plan layout, which seems to be popular with the people that have bought it and the other ones are looking at it, so. Yeah, it's great. And I mean, it's great to see the project going so uh, so fast. It uh, certainly needed. Okay, um, I don't have any other speakers, so I'll ask the committee if they have any questions or comments. Seeing none, I guess you don't have to recruit any of that, Mark, you're good. So, uh, I get, Annalene, if you want to do the resolutions, I would go for the approval one. Certainly through you, Mayor Bridge. Uh, it would be that the Town of Minto, the Town of Mental Committee of Adjustment approves the application by Frandmark Development Company Limited for a property legally described as Park Park Lot 17 Southside Margaret, Register Plan 61R 6234, Parts 1 to 6 in the former town of Harrison Municipally known as 99 Arthur Street West, in the Town of Mental with frontage onto both Arthur Street West and Brock Street to provide relief from section 35.28 B4 and section 32.28 C5 of the Town of Mental's Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw as amendment. The relief granted from section 35.28 B4 is to reduce the minimum exterior side yard setback adjacent to Arthur Street and Brock Street to 2.93 meters or 9.6 feet for lot 1, 9, 10, and 16 on the provided site sketch. The relief granted from section 35.28 C5 is to reduce the minimum yard setback to 2.93 meters, 9.6 feet for lot 12 and 14. We would just require a mover and a seconder. Thank you, Annalene. And moved by Deputy Mayor Turton and seconded by uh, Councilor Dirksen. Uh, anybody opposed? That's carried. Good work, Mark. Uh, happy building. Thanks. Thanks right. for your help. Thank you. Uh, anyone wishing to receive a copy of the notice of, of decision of the Committee of Adjustments with respect to the minor variance application must make a written request to the clerk of the Town of Minto at 5941 Highway 89, Harrison NOG, 1Z, or email at annaline at town.minto.on.ca. I'll declare this officially uh, meeting closed. And I have a resolution moved by Deputy Mayor Turton, second by Council Gutson, that the Town of Minto Committee of Adjustment convenes into the Committee of the Whole. Anybody opposed? That is carried. Good, we have no other public meetings. Uh, delegations, we're looking forward to this delegation and I see Deputy Mayor Turton is here and there's Phil. Mm -hmm. Welcome Phil. Thank and, you. Uh, we always look forward to, uh, I'll turn it over to Deputy Mayor Turton in a minute, but always look forward to uh, you coming in and giving us an update on Maitland Valley. So I'll turn it over to uh, Deputy Mayor Turton who is a, knows exactly what's going on here. So I'll turn it over to you. Dave. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bridge. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, council members, staff. Uh, yeah, as you know, I'm, I'm appointed uh, uh, by Minto, Mapleton and Wellington North to as a member of the MBCA. Everybody knows Phil. I'm, I'm supposed to be introducing Phil, but Phil <laughs> is, uh, according to our mayor, uh, Phil's welcome anytime. And I think it, that case is in the same in uh, Mapleton and North Wellington. Anyways, uh, Phil is going to, I'm going to assist Phil in the presentation this afternoon. We're gonna go over some highlights uh, of the work undertaken in 2021, uh, an overview of our priorities for 2022. Uh, we're gonna outline the pressures on our budget, uh, proposed levy increases, and outline some of the regulatory changes that are impacting conservation authorities and their member municipalities. As you can see by the map,
16 uh, member municipalities who govern the Maitland watershed. Conservation Authority was established in 1951 by the province at the request of the municipalities in the watershed to help them conserve the health of the rivers, soils, forests, and waterlands uh, and wetlands in the watershed and to help municipalities deal with flooding and erosion and water quality issues. And we know all about that in Minto. We have several municipalities that share a representative uh, uh, like uh, Minto, Wellington North and Mapleton. We have Huron, Kinloss and South Bruce. We have Perth East and, Perth and West Perth. Um, we are governed by the Conservation Authorities Act who outlines our mandate, governance, powers and responsibility. Our mission is to provide leadership to protect and enhance water, uh, uh, forests and soils. And looking at that picture, it certainly uh, be a great day to go fishing. Our priorities, uh, MVCA priorities, uh, flood and erosion safety to help our member municipalities reduce the potential for loss of life, property damage, and social disruption in flood and erosion prone areas. Uh, watershed stewardship uh, to help our member municipalities and landowners develop and implement soil and water conservation systems that will help keep soil and nutrients on the land and out of the water courses and the lake. Uh, conservation areas. Ensure that the, that the management of our conservation areas sets high standards of conservation practices and are safe for the public to use. Uh, financial stability. Develop a stable financial base for the MVCA so that we're able to help our member municipalities develop a, develop a healthy and resilient and prosperous watershed. For those of you that have been sitting here for the last four years uh, or five years, maybe six, uh, we've had these uh, same four priorities and uh, we're working hard <coughs> on all of them. So, Bill, I think I'm going to ask you to take us into the next. So welcome, Phil. Phil needs no introduction. Everybody knows Phil. So thank you, Phil, for coming. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'll just run through some of our uh, priorities here for the coming year and things we've accomplished over the last year. So starting with flood and erosion safety, one of our major projects uh, over the next three years is to update the hazard mapping along the lake here and shoreline. High water levels have increased the risk of gully erosion, shoreline erosion, and uh, uh, bluff collapse. Uh, could I go back to the previous slide, please? Thank you. Uh, there's over 800 buildings uh, located in these areas at risk, uh, valued at over 360 million. So this uh, information is very important to the owners of these uh, buildings and to the municipalities. The municipalities will use this information for developing emergency response plans and for identifying areas where new development can be safely located and where existing development can be moved back from the top of the bank. Next slide, please. So now that we have the Floodplain mapping updated in Harriston. Uh, we're working with the town to review the policies for the special policy area. Those policies have been in place since uh, Mayor Bridges' father was on council back in 1987. Next slide, please. So Maitland Valley has uh, over half a million dollars worth of flood forecasting equipment and uh, hardware and software to maintain. Um, we monitor this system seven days a week, 24 hours a day. The majority of our rain gauges, which are the blue dots, are located upstream of Harriston, Lucknow, and Listowel. And these gauges were installed to monitor for those isolated, intensive rainfall events. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so in 2021, um, we installed a radio repeater on the top of the water tower in Palmerston. Um, the water tower 
relay project was triggered by Rogers' sudden shutdown of their 3G cell service. Um, Fortunately, our equipment provider was able to provide a fix by changing the service from Rogers to Bell, who still supports 3G to keep our uh, current system running. And the radio repeater uh, provides Maitland Valley with good radio line of sight to both Minto and Listowel uh, equipment. And there's a, a telemetry hub at the Palmerston Wastewater Treatment Plant that gathers and sends data um, <clears throat> from all our stations. So we really appreciate the Town of Minto's cooperation with this project. Next please. Um, as part of the flood mitigation strategy, uh, background work for Harriston, um, the public had asked that a restoration plan be developed for the North Maitland watershed uh, to outline how we can improve uh, the health and resilience of the North Maitland River. This report was finalized in 2021 and is available for the municipality to review and to determine how they'd like to use this information. And Maitland Valleys um, can help support the implementation of this work by working with landowners to obtain grants through the Wellington Clean Water Project. Next slide, please. Uh, Maitland Valley is also updating its forest health assessment that was undertaken 20 years ago. We've partnered with Bruce, Huron, and Perth counties to undertake this project. Forests are an integral part of the health of the watershed for protecting water quality, stream flow, and biodiversity. And forests are under a lot of stress from invasive insects such as the ash borer, disease, and our changing climate. So this project will help us identify the current health of our woodlots and how landowners can improve their health and resiliency. Next slide, please. So Maitland Valley stewardship staff assist landowners across the watershed to undertake stewardship projects to keep soil and nutrients on the land and out of water courses. We work with hundreds of landowners every year to undertake a variety of stewardship projects. Some of the key practices that we're working with farmers on are cover crops, rural stormwater management, restoration of floodplain, river valley, and riparian areas. And Maitland Valley delivers the Wellington Rural Water Quality Project in the areas within the North Maitland watershed. In 2021, there were three projects completed in Minto. Next slide, please. So turning to our, our conservation areas, uh, Maitland Valley has 28 conservation areas for a total of 4,600 acres of land. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, our conservation areas have experienced an incredible increase in use over the past two years. More people have discovered the value of nature to both their physical and mental health. Next slide, please. One of the major projects we undertook last year was to, um, at the Gorey Conservation Area, the uh, old mill dam was removed, the Gorey Mill was removed, and the river's been restored to improve fish habitat. The floodplain's been planted with trees, shrubs, and wildflowers. And this year we'll be undertaking more naturalization work upstream of the dam site and repairing the uh, picnic shelter that you can see. Next slide, please. As part of our uh, infrastructure renewal strategy, we're gonna be upgrading our workshop at our admin center in Roxeter and also building a new storage building for vehicles, equipment, and storage and materials. So the new storage building will be used for distributing trees and shrubs to landowners and municipalities uh, in the spring and the fall. So now I'll turn it over to Dave to conclude our presentation. Thank you, Phil. Uh, ne next slide, thank you. As I mentioned, uh, one of our priorities is to stabilize our funding base so that we can continue to provide a high level of service within the watershed for our core services and to maintain our essential infrastructure and equipment. 
We are increasing the budget so that we can stabilize and strengthen our core services and to take uh, steps to meet the new regulatory requirements. We have developed an infrastructure strategy to decommission surplus infrastructure and to maintain and replace essential infrastructure. So our 2022 draft budget, uh, so the MVCA's draft budget for 2022 is just over $5 million. Next slide, please. So the, uh, the, the draft levy for 2022 is one of the main drivers uh, for the increase. The increased maintenance and management in conservation areas, uh, replacement of essential infrastructure and decommissioning of surplus infrastructure. Increased applications for development in hazardous areas and increased demand for stewardship assistance to protect soil and water resources. Next slide, please. So the Minister of the Environment, uh, Conservation and Parks requires conservation authorities to focus their resources in three areas, natural hazards, conservation areas, and drinking water source protection. There will be the, the only service that we can levy to municipalities, sorry, these will be the only services we can levy to municipalities starting in 2024. Watershed stewardship steward, uh, services are considered to be a non-mandatory service. It will be up to each member municipality to decide if they are willing to support a levy for this service. However, should be noted that the staff who work in stewardship also help out with other service areas that are mandatory. Next slide, please. So conservation authorities are required to undertake the following steps to get ready for the transition to the regulatory changes. All conservation authorities uh, were required to submit a transition plan to the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks and our member municipalities outlining our timeline to identify the agreements we need to put in place for mandatory and non-mandatory services by December 31st, 2021. We must send out an inventory of services and programs, but we plan to deliver it in 2024 to the ministry and member municipalities by February 28th, 2022. The inventory of programs and services was sent to all municipalities on Friday, February 25th. Um, we need to have agreements in place for all non-mandatory services by January 1st, 2024. Um, so the MVCA would like to develop one agreement with its member municipalities that includes both mandatory and non-mandatory services. We believe this will make it simpler MVCA has only one service that is considered to be non-mandatory, and it's an extension services for stewardship, uh, tree planting, soil and water conservation, monitoring the health of forests, rivers, soil, and delivery of, of the Wellington and the Heron Clean Water Projects. Uh, stewardship services are core service in the Maitland watershed. They represent less than 10% of the levy. Our extension staff also help to deliver mandatory services. The MVC would like to develop an agreement for all services with our member municipalities by the end of June, 2022. So we'd be happy uh, to answer any questions that council may have on the information we have provided. So any questions? Go ahead, Mr. Elliott. Yeah, just um, about the gory and removing the dam and everything. It looks pretty good from, from, the, from the picture showing. Actually, I drove through there the other day and it does look very good. Does that help with, with flooding upstream or uh, in Harrison? Does it, does it move the water through more quickly and, and does it hurt when it gets to Roxeter or, or on down? Is there any difference or could you let me know that? No, there's no, no impact, um, Councillor Elliott. It, the main control for water getting through Gory is the bridge, the county road bridge that's there. That's the main obstruction. So uh, okay. it, the, the dam had no flood control value at all. Yeah, it was pretty old. All right, thanks. Go ahead, Councillor Dirksen. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Churton. Um, 
uh, Phil, you had said uh, you were talking about the 3G um, you, the repeater on the um, that you were able to get that from Bell. Do you think uh, Bell's future is to get rid of 3G as well? That's what we're concerned about. So that this we're looking at this as an interim plan. Right. Yeah, that's a little concerning, isn't it? It is. It is because. Rogers dropped it very quickly and we had to really scramble to, to come up with this fix, so. Okay, thanks. Mayor Bridge. Just a couple of comments and uh, thanks Phil for being here. And uh, I know uh, I wanna give Deputy Mayor Turton a lot of credit for spending his time and effort on your board and being the chair at one time. So uh, we appreciate it certainly. Um, we, we're no stranger to water situations in Harrison. And, and we know somebody asked me the other day, I said, if my, nobody's given me the $23 million, so we haven't moved the river yet, but I, I get that. I, when I met in my, some of my other meetings uh, that I get that, they know that we're looking at possibly doing that someday. So it's quite interesting, but um, it's, it's been a tra transition time for you guys. And uh, I really appreciate all the hard work that you've done for us uh, in, in our mapping and, and work, work we've done as far as our flood mitigation. And certainly I, I feel very comfortable that uh, this, this council will be there for you and try to work with you as much as we can and, and within our minimum amount, amount of uh, money that uh, I know Gord keeps quite uh, close to his vest, we'll try our best to be there to help you support going into this transition. I really think there's a lot of good work being done and uh, we wanna keep it going. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none, I just again, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to thank the council this afternoon for uh, for Phil and myself to come and present this. Uh, I'd also like to thank the board, uh, the MVCA board, as, as many as know, um, I did serve as chair for three years and my term ended uh, last month. So I thank Phil. I, I mean, it's, uh, it's quite an operation at uh, the MVCA, uh, minimal staff, uh, minimal dollars uh, coming and going and uh, um, it's an amazing uh, group that Phil has. And uh, Phil, I just want to uh, thank you as well as uh, as take it back to your staff and, and continued support. Our new chair will be uh, or is now Mr. Matt Duncan from uh, North Perth. So good mm -hmm. luck in the future, Phil, and thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Phil. Okay. Our next, our next delegation follows right along with watching those great uh, uh, shots, uh, Dave, of the river and not full of ice and whatever, that we're looking at the, the spring and going fishing. And we're gonna take it one more step further. I've got Tanya here to talk about getting on the golf course. And uh, it's always nice to see Tanya in, in replacing Janet this year. And she was last year, she was off and on leave as we know. So Tanya, thank you for, uh, making this presentation today about the Mayor's Golf Tournament. Go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, through you, Mayor Bridge. The 12th Annual Mayor's Charity Golf Tournament will be held on Thursday, August the 4th at Pike Lake Golf and Country Club. We are now accepting applications to receive this year's tournament proceeds from nonprofit organizations that fit into one of the three following categories, community betterment, service clubs, or sports clubs. Applications will be accepted until Monday, April the 4th, and will be available on our website or can be picked up at the municipal office. Over the past 11 years, the Mayor's Charity Golf Tournament has raised over $117,000 and has assisted 38 local groups or organizations with their financial expenses or events. Last year, two organizations benefited from the proceeds. Previous funds have been used to beautify our downtowns, purchase new sports equipment, fundraise for many community reunions and events, and there have been many projects that have benefited youth in Minto. Last year, we had a very, very full tournament and we are hoping that this year's event will be another great success. We look forward to supporting and assisting our local groups again this year. Thanks, Tanya. You're welcome. Um, any questions? Get your teams in 
Um, we're, yeah, we're hoping that we can have a full one. As, as we said, we're going to have it uh, able to have the dinner and everything. That's fingers crossed. Yeah, um, sure. But, uh, appreciate all the hard work that, that Tanya has and, and the staff that help her with it and, uh, and the groups. We enjoy having the groups. It's just amazing to do that. So good stuff. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Tanya. Next up, I have correspondence. Um, and there's quite a long list there. Um, there's a couple of things that are going to be coming out later, so I'm not going to pull anything myself, but has anybody got anything they want to pull from the correspondence? If not, I'm moved by Councilor McKenzie, second by Council Anderson, that Council receives the correspondence's information. Anybody opposed? Seeing none, that is passed. Okay, reports of committees. And I'll turn it over to Councilor Elliott to take this on. There you go. Yes, thank you, Mayor Bridge. And I'll pass this over to uh, Matt Lubers. Our, it's not our PRAC anymore. What's it called, Matt? Well, we, we got to get them uh, minutes approved <laughs> first and then we'll, we may have a different name, but yes, um, thanks. Thanks, Council Elliott. Um, so the PRAC notes here are from our January meeting, which we held over Zoom. Um, programs and facilities were shut down for most of January and at the time of our meeting only after school programming had been up and running. And at that time it had just been announced that we could resume everything else as of January the 31st. So since then we reopened the Norgan for private rentals and brought the feature film Sing 2 in over Family Day weekend. We're targeting March break to open for weekend feature films on a consistent basis at the Norgan. Our walking, shuffleboard, and pickleball programming resumed, and we're using a platform called Pickup Hub to assist with how we offer pickleball at the Clifford Hall right now. Um, in the meantime, Grace, Greg, and I are in the middle of getting the Active Network platform ready for our other town-run programming, specifically swim lessons starting in June and summer day camp starting in July. Our intention is to go live for registration on April the 4th, and being that today's March the 1st, that is just around the corner. Um, as an aside, we are offering March break day camp and two weeks at the Harrison Arena. This is something that we weren't able to do for the past couple of years and registration is, is full for that. So the, there's a definite need in the community for, for day camp and um, child care programming. Um, at the other facilities, all major groups have resumed their seasons and we've hosted a number of tournaments for broomball and minor hockey already. And I think the big news is that as of today, capacity restrictions and proof of vaccination requirements covered by provincial regulations are lifted. Um, however, it's important to note that the use of face coverings is still in effect at this time. Uh, lastly, as uh, Councillor Elliott uh, alluded to, and as a bit of a housekeeping item, the committee did make a motion to change its name from Parks and Recreation to Community Services Advisory Committee. And that's to align with the name of the department. That's all I got. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'll make a motion and then we can ask questions after that. I uh, moved by Councillor Dirksen and seconded by Deputy Mayor Turton that the council receive the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee meeting minutes of January 24th, 2022 as information and approves any recommendations contained therein. Um, any questions on or comments? Seeing none, uh, those opposed? That's carried. And I'll pass that back to our mayor. Thanks, Matt. Thanks and welcome to your new name there, Matt. And uh, that's good. All right, uh, now we have trails and uh, it's Paul here. Go ahead, Paul. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Bridge and members of council. I've got minutes here to present from the trails committee meeting from uh, January 17th, so a couple months ago. Um, we had, as, as it happens, you've got uh, terms that come up from the, the members that are on the committee. We had a couple of people whose terms um, we're, we're at a point to either uh, step back or to renew those. And so we, those two members were Jill Welsh and Ron Faulkner. Jill has uh, opted to continue on with the committee and Ron is going to step aside and ask the committee to 
uh, re look for replacement uh, on his behalf. He's, he's served quite a bit of time on that and, and certainly been a, a strong and guiding force with the committee um, for a number of years. So we really appreciate his input and uh, certainly will uh, be someone that we miss uh, at those meetings. Um, a couple of the other items there that uh, came up that are some of them are recurring and some of them new. Um, unfortunately, we heard uh, very um, soon before that we met uh, the passing of Scotty Forbes of Palmerston. So he and mm -hmm. some, I would think quite a number of people will be familiar with he and his wife, uh, Susan, who were very active members on the, the Palmerston component of the Trails Committee. And, and I think in other aspects of the community as well, um, very gracious couple and uh, we certainly feel for, for Susan and uh, she has had to step back from the committee prior because of her obligations there too. So um, we all felt it fitting to, to do something that was meaningful um, in Scotty's honor on the trail system. So we've, we've done a little bit of discussion about that, but uh, haven't laid on anything uh, definite. I, I, I think a, a tree planting would, would probably be something that we could do fairly quickly in the, the spring, but it would be um, nice to also have something that's maybe a little bit more uh, substantial. So we're we're still giving that some consideration and we'll, we'll hopefully move forward with that uh, sooner than later too. Um, we had, uh, obviously we've had to put some events on, on hold the last couple of seasons as, as many have, and um, we're, we're doing some planning uh, at this stage for things that we, we definitely want to make a go of this year. And a lot of that is just awareness, um, getting more people involved with using the trails and appreciating the trails. And uh, um, some of that being some photo contests, we want to do a, a cleanup in the spring. Uh, that will be more just uh, let's get out and, and lend a helping hand and maybe take some photos and share those on social media. Uh, Photo contest, I think we'll run through the duration of the year and, and do a couple of categories with some prizes to encourage people to participate. And then probably some sort of scavenger hunt. So we think we might do that on a monthly basis. And it might be something very specific that people need to pretty much delve into the whole system to be able to find what we're targeting that they're looking for. And uh, then uh, for, for every contribution they make, every uh, month that they contribute to that, they'll have uh, their name entered in for the end of the season to do to do a prize and haven't 100 percent decided what those will be um we approach some of the local businesses we um may look at some of the nursery stock that uh will come in whether it's through maitland valley or whether it's through green legacy and uh we've got some of that stuff lined up too and ready to do some plantings i think everybody's keen to get their shovels in the ground and their their hands dirty at this this point of the season i feel like we've kind of rounded the bend with it um I think that's that's the bulk of the big pieces. The other the other um, item is the that has come to to the forefront before. There there's several members of the committee. They they see value in um, the system as a whole. Um, any of the pieces that for whatever reason and and in this case it's the bridge there at the the Y component of the White's Junction Trail that uh, is no longer accessible. Um, they see value in in not letting those components of the trail fall by the wayside. So they're, they're hoping that uh, council will support them in looking, and we don't know what time frame, but looking at um, means of, of seeking funding to, to, to replace or repair or, or um, improve those sections of the trail. So uh, that might be grant opportunities, uh, could be some, some community fundraisers, uh, nothing specific there. But uh, I think that that summarizes what uh, we discussed there in January. So I'm open to, to questions at this point. Thank, thanks, Paul. And uh, I don't know what Councillor Elliott was just at the point that he didn't want to work that hard today or something, but he threw this back at me. It's not mine. It's, it's actually Councillor Elliott. So I'm going to let you take the role there, Ron. It's, well, this is you know what? I've, I've never been a chair of this. It's usually been uh, Councillor Dirksen that takes the role on on the trails so i don't know how i got thrown into this i thought well, uh, I, well you're, you're definitely it like so. i don't know i just i don't think oh, yeah. uh, paul wants me there too bad and I'm better <laughs> off with Councilor Dirksen. <laughs> anyhow I'll, i can take take it but i wasn't at the meetings or are not part of the committee uh counselor mckenzie's part of that and uh i don't know uh, how that would work do you want me to carry on with this or well, I can do it then. Uh, it, it just falls under Parks and Rec. That's why you got it, I think. 
Well, you know, anyway, uh, I'll take I'll take the questions on. Has anybody got any questions? Uh, and and Paul, thank you for all your hard work on this. Go ahead, Councillor Elliott. You got a question? Uh, just, just a quick comment about that that bridge. I know we received some insurance policies. We decided that we wouldn't rebuild it, and the money would go into uh, um, enhancing the trails and such like. I believe that was the case. And um, for us now to put money back into the town of Mendo, if if it's if, if there's funds being raised somewhere else to to rebuild the bridge, I have no problem with that. But to use the taxpayers' money, I wouldn't be for that at the time. So I uh, certainly would support somebody else raising the funds and bring it forth. Uh, I would be okay with that, but I don't think I would be for the taxpayers paying for it. Well, I think rather than getting into a discussion today, I think Paul that, that we'll look back in the history. But I think Councillor Elliott's right. We have we've had some history on what we're doing there and what what that trail might end up being down the road. So uh, we'll get back to and to the group and uh, maybe through Derek, uh, maybe have some discussion on that. Uh, Derek, I was just concerned about if we accept the minutes, we're promoting that we will support them. I, I think the minutes are, I, I don't think they're making an, I don't think they're making an observation that more than a, a recommendation at this point, but go ahead, Derek. Yeah, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, specifically Councillor Elliott. Um, a, a request like this, Councillor Elliott would have to be accompanied with a staff report. Um, so as, as the mayor has indicated, we'll, we'll have to do a staff report on this and, and provide some history and, and uh, suggest whatever that recommendation might be um, from the staff side, because it, it would require a budget amendment to do that. Um, so I, I would say we would wait until a staff report comes forth and we can have a further discussion on it. Yeah, I think we can still accept the minutes, can we not, Derek? I mean, that's yeah. that, the minutes. I mean, I don't, I think Paul's just bringing it up that that's a discussion around the table, right? Yeah, and and more more than uh, asking the, the, the council approve funding for it it's it's just that they they would be we would have their support if we're looking for on, on the broader spectrum to raise funds whether it's through grants right. or other sure. yeah okay so we'll, yeah we'll, we'll look into that and uh, otherwise i think we can accept minutes and it's uh it's moved by councillor anderson second by Councilor mckenzie the council uh, received the mental trails committee minutes of january 17 2022 as information and approves any recommendations can, contained therein Okay. Anybody opposed? Deputy Mayor Turton, did you have a Yeah, question? so I just, uh, thank you, Mayor Bridge. I just have a question for Paul. Um, just wondering if our friend, uh, Mr. Coffey has reached out at all about the pumpkin, <laughs> pumpkin growing contest. And I think we should, you and I should get together and, and possibly uh, come up with some sort of a competition or something this well, year. I, I think oh, basically sorry. you got to be a little careful about people using special products for it. And I think it was fixed last time. <laughs> yeah, it should be a natural pumpkin growing. <laughs> uh, don't worry, it, Deputy Mayor Turton's not the only one who's been scheming over the winter months. <laughs> okay. All, right. All right. Yeah, yeah, thanks Deputy Mayor Turton for that uh, little, little work on thank that. You. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anybody opposed? No? Okay, carried. And I'll, I guess I got the chair back now, so I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Belinda for the Economic Development Planning Meeting. Go ahead. Huh? Yeah, uh, good afternoon, Mayor Bridge and members of council. While Paul was here, I just wanted to mention, don't ever underestimate the uh, value of our trail system. We are doing our Move to Minto campaign right now and talking to a lot of our new residents who many are referencing uh, that's one of their favorite parts of living Minto is our great trail system. So kudos great. to Paul and the trails committee for their great work. And uh, if our department can assist with any events or grants, we're happy to support them. All right, I'll jump in quickly with the minutes and the highlights here. Um, Ashley, Perry and Dave joined us at our last meeting. So we had a great conversation around down, downtown commercial zoning. And we have some questions we're going to take forward to the Chamber of Commerce and get their feedback on some of this stuff as well. Um, trying to balance the need for residential housing and attainable housing with also keeping uh, the right amount of space for commercial retail development in our downtown. So that's what that was about. Obviously, you can see the great uh, building permit numbers there. I'm not going to go into that. This summer did a great job of highlighting all the ways that through launching in our department, we support entrepreneurship. So the list is there. 
And I'm just gonna jump right ahead to the grant uh, applications that the committees reviewed. So Jima Holmes and Fallis Fallis McMillan submitted signage grants for signs that they have done this year. Um, the first one was for 209 Main Street Palmerston and it qualified for 50% funding, which would be 845.69. And for 233 Main Street Palmerston, again, qualified for full funding, which would be 50%. At 852.92, the committee recommended that that um, be approved. Uh, they also reviewed a facade application for 233, um, which was the Fallis Fallis and McMillan Law Office for new windows. That was not included in their 2021 application. So that was approved at 50% for $800. And then lastly, we reviewed the Harrison Legion structural grant. So you would have recalled that in 2021, the Legion approached us about helping fund an elevator. Um, it is well over $100,000. They had applied for provincial and federal grants, um, had not received any. They're still waiting word on about $29,000 in grants. And um, obviously, the Legion is a huge, um, important uh, piece in our community, in our downtown. Uh, many people use that facility. And for that reason, our Economic Development Committee recommended supporting uh, that project with $20,000. And as with all of our grant programs, none of the funds go out until the projects are completed and uh, proof of payment has been provided. So those are the highlights of those um, committee minutes. If there's any questions. Through you, Mayor Bridge, you are muted. And I see Councillor McKenzie has his hand up. Okay, I'm just going to move the uh, re recommendation. Uh, moved by Councillor Elliott, second by Councillor Cutson. The Council receives the Economic Development Planning Committee minutes of February 11th, 2022, as information and approves any recommendations that are contained therein. And uh, any questions? I see Councillor McKenzie, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to ask if we could uh, defer the Legion. Uh, request until they're finished applying for their funding. They have to reapply for Trillium and the, and the federal one uh, enabling accessibility fund for elevators. Hasn't, they're going to apply for that apparently. So I think results, the results from those, then maybe we could chat with them again for further funding. So so Mark, just between, and I think Belinda mentioned it at the end, like we can approve the, approve the fundings there for them. They don't, they can't get any of the funds until they actually show us the receipts, right? So we're not actually putting money out. So you're saying that I, and I think Belinda mentioned it and I think you and I had a chat. They didn't, they didn't get the Trillium grant this time around, right? Is that what your concern is? Well, one of them, they, that, they, they did not. It was a technical error that, that they didn't get it. Okay. And but the other one, they didn't apply for the federal one, enabling enabling accessibility oh. funding for elevators for a hundred thousand. And I talked to the the president the other day, and he said they were definitely trying to apply for that. Okay. So I think they, they probably will get some good results after the two more applications, and right. we could discuss it again then. So Belinda, what what's your thoughts? I mean, I I think go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say the only issue is like our grants are first come first serve. So if we do not like approve this and it gets, you wait, and then they receive funding or don't receive funding from those other organizations, then we might not have that $20,000 earmarked for them, um, which would be unfortunate. Um, I'm not sure how long they want to continue to wait to do this. and. I know, like from what I understood from Mary Lou Caldwell, who submitted their application, was that the only grants that they had outstanding, the total amount they would get is twenty nine thousand dollars, which is a long way off the hundred plus thousand dollars they're going to need for the project. So even if they did get that twenty nine thousand, they're still going to need support to complete the project. And, and that would be my concern, Mark, if we don't go ahead with the, putting it aside. I mean, again, you, they're not gonna get the money up front until they actually start the project and, and pay the bills out. So, but we are dedicating the money to them. If we, if we don't do that now, they may not down the road get it because somebody else might come along and get it this year. And that's what I'm saying, right, Belinda? Yes, that's concerned. correct. Yep. 
So you mean they would start the project without getting further funding from the province or the feds? No, we don't. They don't have to start the project, but we but we will park the money for them for now, right? Well, that's yeah. Fine. They if, can't. They if they did get their grants, what happens to the the money that we're allocating to? If they don't need it, back? then it, if they don't need it, then they they won't they won't need it, right? So that's fine too. And then we'll put it to some other use, right? But what if they're short? What if they're short? Is what we're saying. Like they're asking for it now. We're not sure they're going to get. The total. I know they haven't applied for that one. That they might get more, but I don't know. Deputy Mayor Turton. Yes, thank you, Mayor Bridge, uh, Belinda. I just wondered if we could put. Uh, I mean, I think it's important that we give the twenty we allocated to them. But if they do get a bunch of money, um, is it something that they? I think it was a little alluded to a little bit that they could possibly just give it back. Yeah, we wouldn't give it to them, basically, like, and they wouldn't accept it either. Like, <laughs> I trust that if the Legion received um, a lot of grant money, they're not going to yeah. take take our money. But this would ensure that it's there if if they need it and they are able to proceed with the project and pay their bills, then it's there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let me re-clarify here. I mean, if the, the thing is, you'd only get this money once you've actually spent the money, right, Belinda? Yeah, so, you have to complete so, I mean, the project. You know, the the yeah. project has to be completed for them to put the receipts in to get the money. So it's not a case of if, if they don't need it going forward, if they get lucky and these other two grants come through and they don't need it, then they won't even ask for it. So it's not like having to give it back. We're not giving it to them until they start the project and complete the project. Councillor Elliott. Have we any idea what kind of money they got in their bank accounts? Like I, I know they do chase the ace and make good dollars on that. And, and I, I'm not sure where they've donated their money back and maybe they have enough money in their bank account to be able to cover more of this than what we think. I, I, I don't, I'm not questioning their integrity. I'm just wondering if we ever asked that. So, so, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I think you have to go on the validity and uh, we've done this before. We've gone down this road. If people are asking for money, you've got to realize that they don't have it themselves. Okay. And when these situations, I would think, uh, Councillor Elliott, that would be my thought. And this is a big project. This is like in the hundreds yeah. of thousands. So, um, and uh, Mary Lou is the one that came to us with this and I have a lot of confidence in her. And I if you know, as I said, like I, we want to park the money for them. Hopefully, they can get the rest of the funding. If not, then we, they might have to come back to us for other avenues. Because without them fixing this elevator, I can tell you right now, their revenue goes south because they can't get upstairs. And you know, yeah. they've been in COVID and everything else. And I think we just don't want to. I don't want to put any roadblocks up in front of the legion in this case. And I don't think we're we're gambling any money because the project doesn't start. It doesn't. The money doesn't go out. So it's I, like I'm, not, I'm not questioning that at all. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I missed the presentation because I was wandering around the internet at economic development. So I didn't get the chance to, uh, our, our chairman kicked me off. Right. Just <laughs> I, I think the report. So, so I just, I didn't miss the presentation. Those are questions that I, I thought should be asked. And, um, I, like I say, I trust, I trust their integrity and we'll go with that. Yeah, thanks. Okay. So has any, anybody else got any questions on this? I think, go ahead, Dr. Mayor Yes, thanks, Mayor Bridge. So I, I'm pretty sure that the uh, the money they make on the ACE is uh, they have certain places they can spend yep. and certain places they cannot. I mean, the, both legions have had the same issue as everybody else over the last two years. They have not been able to raise money. And um, I do know that uh, um, the elevator has been a problem for a number of years and uh, and you know we're supporting uh, where we need to support. So, yeah. okay. Anything else, uh, Councillor McKenzie? Yeah, Belinda, do we know? Do we know how much the Legion's going to put towards the project? Or they're trying to like they're trying to raise as much as they can. Like they've applied for all of the grants. They've asked us about possible grants. We sent them to places. They've talked to John Nader. They've applied for all the possible grants they can get. Um, they're trying to raise money and this is one of our programs that supports downtown Great. buildings accessibility um, programs so this is another program that will help them to achieve what they need to achieve so 
okay, I, I'm on the same page. I want to help them out. But if they do, a, like, if they do get successful in these two, then they won't take the money, Mark. They won't would, take like, the money. They need to reapply for Trillium and that. So if that happens, uh, is there a condition there that we'll they'll turn the money back or? They, they don't have it. to. They don't have to send any money back. They just would not like. We wouldn't have to give it to them. Like so, if they receive the trillion funding, they can't start the project until right. they um, get like. If they were successful with trillion, they couldn't start until they re like got the go ahead from them. And then they would tell us we don't need the money now because we got trillion money. So it's not like we're sending them any money. Um, if they're successful with grants, then they don't need our money. <laughs> But if they aren't, and we don't do this, they may not even have our money to do this project. So. Right on, yeah. Yeah, okay. Any other, okay, that's Councilor Godson. Just a quick comment. Is this not the same agreement we had with the first 20,000 that if they got the grants, they weren't gonna use the 20,000 anyway? So Correct. we're in the same boat with just another 20,000, right? Exactly. Correct, yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, anybody opposed? That's carried. Okay. I'll turn it over to Judy now. Go ahead, Judy. Thank you, Mayor Bridge. And um, I'll call on our roads and drainage manager, Mike McIsaac, to bring us the report. Thank you, Councillor Dirksen. Uh, this report is, uh, is, is brought forward uh, based, uh, on fo as follow-up on a couple of inquiries that were uh, came to Council in uh, 2021 for future consideration around the uh, potential installations, uh, locations for additional PXOs or pedestrian crossovers in Harriston, as well as the installation of inclusivity crosswalks uh, throughout our community. Uh, staff in Triton uh, reviewed the intersection of John Street and Arthur Street West in Harriston and found that the, the that intersection actually does not um, meet the warrants uh, required uh, for the installation of, of a PXO system in that location. However, the intersection of Young Street and Alora Street South uh, does meet the requirements uh, for the installation of a PXO. Um, and with the design and potential impl implementation of this PXO, staff uh, considered this would be uh, the ideal uh, location to use a pilot project uh, to include the to include an inclusivity uh, crosswalk similar to various other communities such as Owen Sound, uh, Milton and uh, Bradford, uh, just to name a few other ones that are out there. Uh, the installation of the PXO was included in the capital budget um, and the uh, color palette uh, to be used for the uh, the pride crosswalk or the inclusivity crosswalk is proposed to be completed with funds raised by the pride group. Um, is there any questions or comments? Okay, silence. Okay, um, I just wanted to bring forward that I did receive some cards and letters and calls and I don't know whether anybody else did or not. Um, I guess uh, one of the comments was that painted crosswalks can be distracting and their number one job is to stop vehicular traffic so that uh, pedestrians can safely cross and adding color to a crosswalk of any kind doesn't, doesn't change that. Um, and then some people were concerned about uh, the precedents, uh, who wants to paint a crosswalk next? And uh, for truly welcoming and inclusive, then that means that um, unless it's something hateful, um, that we would uh, maybe feel that we needed to say yes uh, every time. Um, and then uh, cost of maintenance was another uh, item that was that I pulled from those uh, notes that I got. I don't know if anybody else got any uh, anything to comment on on any of those things. Um, I did wonder, is the, is, is the crosswalk solar powered, Mike? Yes, it would be, yes. Yeah. Okay. Similar, similar to the other two that are currently in place on uh, uh, at George and Arthur and Alora and William Streets, yep. Sure, okay, That's, I thought that was the answer, but one of the other things that I pulled was the cost of operations. So really the cost of operation is 
pretty minimal once it's installed because of the solar, right? So yeah, that's correct. Right. Okay. Um, I see a hand there, Mayor Bridge, uh, and then we'll go to Councillor uh, McKenzie and then Councillor Elliott, and I better write that down. Okay, go ahead, Mayor Bridge. There, there we go. I was trying to do the mute and was thinking it was the hand I was touching there. Okay. Um, yeah, and uh, thanks for those comments, Judy. I know we had them, and, and I know uh, Mike's done a lot of research uh, on this, and um, for as far as we're concerned, um, nobody's brought up the fact that there's a problem with colors as far as being distracted. I don't believe there's any kind of, but they wouldn't let you do it if that was the case. Uh, so I think that's that's fine. It was it was brought to your attention. Um, I, I just want to point out to the, the letter from, from our pride group and uh, from our inclusive group. And I just want to make sure that uh, maybe you have uh, uh, Belinda speak to this as well, because this came from the culture round table. And uh, if Linda can maybe add some add some something to this uh, on that bit. Before I go that far though, Belinda, I'm gonna ask you in a minute to talk about that. Um, I think this is something that's going to be continued going forward. I, I hear some rumors in the rest of Wellington County about this happening. So I think uh, from a maintenance standpoint and from a dollars and cents standpoint, I think this will get less and less of a problem. I did talk to Mike, I was concerned about how long it would take for this paint to wear off and he thinks it's about a four year period to to uh, before we have to do it again. Yep. Uh, by that time, I'm, I'm thinking the cost might even be down because of the fact that one of the problems that I as I was talking to Mike about was the fact that because there's not as many of them out there right now that the paint might not last four years if you have used, uh, unused paint, it might not be there four years from now, it might not be viable to use. Uh, but if you get more of these going on, then the county will be doing some of the maintenance afterwards because of the new system. And we're gonna see more crosswalks coming in through the county because of the roads master plan. This is, am I right, Mike, on that? There's gonna be more road and more crosswalks because at one time there was a very difficult to get the county to do a crosswalk. It's in their program now, it's in their community safety program. Yep. Uh, and we're gonna see a lot more of these. Uh, so, but I would like Belinda just to speak to the culture roundtable and what our concerns and what our thoughts were when we uh, brought this forward. Go ahead, Belinda. Yep, thanks, Mayor Bridge. Um, I'll start off by mentioning um, when I started in the town of Minto in 2005, uh, Treasurer Duff and I attended many cultural roundtable events, creative community events. And even back then, um, there was talk about how being inclusive and inclusive community was extremely important for being a welcoming community, growing your community in terms of economic development, workforce, etc. So much so that when we did our um, whole strategic plan at that time, inclusiveness is a key component of that. And this is just, I think, a demonstration um, to show that Minto is an inclusive and welcoming community. I think our Pride Committee has done an excellent job in raising the awareness in our community. Um, Minto is known as a progressive community, um, and this further will demonstrate that. I have no doubt, even though the Minto Pride Committee is um, worried that they might not reach $7,000, I have no doubt that they will. Um, I just think it's an extremely important thing to, if we're going to say we're an inclusive community, that we need to back that up. And um, this demonstrates that with people coming through on that highway, especially look at this community. They are welcoming and inclusive. And as we begin to do more work in this space, this is the beginning of that, I think. So um, hopefully I'm bringing that message forward as our group would um, would want. And uh, yeah, I don't have anything more to say other than it's gonna be extremely important to uh, demonstrate yeah. that we're a welcoming and inclusive community. Okay, thank you, Belinda. And uh, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, through you, uh, Chair Dirksen, I'd like to ask if we could uh, vote on those two items separately. They, they, they seem uh, the crossover and then they request for specialized painting. Could we vote on those two separately, please? So you're asking for an amendment that we take the first two paragraphs separate from the last paragraph then? Is that what you're asking? Well, there's, there's, uh, there's two three paragraphs. Further. There's three paragraphs in the recommendation. So take that council and and further that the first further that take that as one 
Is that what you're saying? Take that as one for the crossover. And yep. the next and further for the specialized painting request is another vote. Okay. Thank you. All right. Is there somebody that would uh, move that amendment? Well, you're going to move that amendment, Mark. Is there a seconder for that amendment? Okay, thank you, Councillor Elliott. Is there anyone opposed to that amendment? Okay, so we, that carries. So we are going to take this recommendation in two parts then. Everybody understand what we're doing? Did I do that right with the voting and so on? I think I did. <laughs> That's should fine. That, should okay. that be an amendment or should that be? Yes, that is an amendment. it is an amended and we voted on the amendment first to say that we were going to separate them out. Okay. I think yeah. that's should do that. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Councillor Elliott, you had your hand up and then Councillor Anderson. Uh, again, I just, I'm a little bit confused. I, I, I thought I read where they could raise $3,500, but they, they expect they couldn't raise any more. To, to help with the project. Secondly, um, uh, we're doing this in Harrison. So the crosswalk in Palmerston, would it be the next? And then would we be moving to Clifford for, for another? Um, so it, that would be $21,000 that we would be spending on, on painting these crosswalks. Um, or we may not be if, if the group has decided that they could raise those kind of funds. If, if they did it in Palmerston and if they did it in Clifford would be each year or would that all happen at one time or would it not happen at all? That's, those are questions I might have to ask to, to help me with uh, the cost thing. Okay, thank you, Councillor Elliott. And I think I have an idea of the answer, but I'm going to uh, ask our CAO Thompson to respond. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and through you to Councillor Elliott. Councillor Elliott, if you can, if you remember back the request from the Cultural Roundtable, it was to consider three um, crosswalks, one in each community. So staff have um, done our investigation, and we're not recommending three. We're rec recommending one in Harrison. Um, the pilot portion of this report is just that, in that because there's some unknowns about the how long the paint will last and those types of things, that's the the pilot part of the of of this report, suggesting that you know we'll review it at 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 the appropriate time and and make further recommendations whether we'll continue it from a maintenance standpoint or not. We haven't gotten there yet because we don't know that information yet. So, but as far as the three go, right now staff are recommending one, and that's in Harrison. Okay, thank you, CEO Thompson, and Councillor Anderson. Yeah, um, just in the bottom part of the paragraph, it suggests that the future maintenance costs would be incurred by the county. But it doesn't sound like that's a done deal. I know you're saying that there's more crosswalks included in the county plans, George, but are they looking at maintaining? Have they talked about the painting of any of them? I expect it's going to be something that's going to go right through the county. So... Uh, through you, Councillor Derson, um, the the county will maintain the the maintenance of the pedestrian crossovers as okay. a pedestrian crossover. Any sort of uh, improvements or the specialty uh, inclusivity paint palette mm -hmm. would be at this point. The county is recommending that it would be incurred. Like the future maintenance costs of that only would be on the town. Okay, so. There's some of these around. Yep. The four years is like, has anybody gotten to the point where they had to repaint them? Or uh, are we just sort of taking a guess at that based on our use of paint on road lines or whatever? So based on the dur durable, uh, the durable paints that would be used on this, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the industry is seeing three years. Um, I think the newest one that was, or the, the, the first one that was implemented was I believe in 2020. Okay. So they, they haven't actually reached the uh, okay. a life cycle on the paint. So we it's just unknown at this point. Because I know when they brought it cultural roundtable, they showed us several diagrams or pictures mm -hmm. of, of walkways that had currently been done. Um, I just didn't know how long they'd been around. Yeah. And from your perspective, like, is that a huge issue for us in our road maintenance? I know we always have money needs for sidewalks, roads, so forth and so on. With with future maintenance, like if say in three years, if there's a few more of these around, 
the mm -hmm. cost of maintenance would come down. Uh, right. The reason for the expense right now is uh, uh, the the estimate that I received from a contractor was there's not that many around. So unfortunately, they would have to buy the Special. container, the container of paint, which is more than enough to do one. So unfortunately, sure. the whoever is asking for the installation would have to bear the cost of the entire um, right portion of paint. Yeah, I got it. OK. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments um, or just, Councillor McKenzie? Yeah, go ahead. One more, uh, Mike. Uh, this isn't really a, a safety issue, is it? it no. Uh, based on the Ontario traffic manuals, in there, um, the the only thing uh, that you can't deviate is away from the the white, mm -hmm. the white paint itself, which is why uh, it was just chosen to do the painting in the uh, the black asphalt components of that pedestrian crossover to be able to implement this as as designed yeah. Yeah. thank you yeah. so mike are you saying that the reason then why there's a color and then white and then a color and a white and color and white is for that reason yep yeah so essentially the 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 colored portions would just be your your straight up your your black asphalt it's not it wouldn't typically be painted the same as what the rest of them are so if there is no guide or uh, there's no limitations to what you can do um, on those black portions of the of the pedestrian crossovers. Oh, OK. Um, because my recollection of your earlier report, or maybe it was the one from the uh, maybe it was the one from the um, uh, sorry, I have to get rid of that. Um, the one from the culture roundtable. I seem to recollect that those pictures were were straight colors. There was no white yeah. between. And I'm quite sure that's the case for the one uh, in Orangeville on Main Street where on Broadway, so, where it's uh, for indigenous, it's it's painted so, orange. Yeah, so the, the differences between a pedestrian crossover, which is the implementation of what we're looking at, which has like the ladder effect going across the road. Some of those other ones that you're seeing is actually a crosswalk going from uh, across in front of a stop sign or a controlled location, which then you don't have the uh, the, the 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 ladder effect going across with the white. Okay. All right. Thanks for explaining that. Okay. Okay, uh, Councillor Elliott. Um, another concern: um, using taxpayers' money for for such like. And I brought that up, and other other subjects that we're we're dealing with. Uh, I have no problem with with having a a crosswalk, but should it should we be doing this for a few or a many? At the, that's kind of what I meant. Uh, I don't know how how else to explain it. Um, so I don't have a problem supporting having having a, a colored crosswalk. Uh, what I do may have a problem with is is the cost. For, are we by passing this motion pay, saying that we are going to pay part of it? We're going to pay all of it. We're going to pay none of it. Um, I don't think that's in the motion, is it? So the so I, the, se the second part of the motion, or the second motion now that we're going to deal with, is actually that recommendation. Uh, you can see in the third paragraph is that the money would be raised. Um, by Minto Pride. So we'd have to see whether that motion uh, sinks or swims. Yes. So, uh, and, then, and then we decide what to do after that if we need so to. So the taxpayer is not on the hook for, for paying the crosswalk? Well, that depends. We don't know that yet. We haven't, we haven't, uh, we haven't dealt with that motion yet. With yeah, but in the motion, you're saying that they say they'll, they'll, they'll do it. That's right. The the so um, if, the if we go for if we money, vote, if we yeah. vote and have a colored crosswalk, they're responsible. We're not. That's the way the motion reads. Yes, for okay. the original paint job, and then and then the plan is right now that we would that the town would be responsible for the maintenance of it. Yes, four years or whatever time that happens to be. Sure, and even with vandalism and such like that, we'd be responsible. I would, I would say so. Okay. 
I don't see, I don't see the CAO uh, waving frantically, so I must be what I'm thinking. Go ahead. <laughs> Through you, uh, Madam Chair, you're absolutely correct. So your first motion is to approve the crosswalk. The second motion is to approve the inclusivenessity of the crosswalk with the portion being paid by uh, mental prep. So you're absolutely correct. Okay, thanks for that clarity. Are we ready for the question? Okay, I'm not seeing anyone else wanting to get in. So I will read the first motion then. The recommendation is that Council of the Town of Minto receives the report PW 2022-006 dated February 15th, 2022 regarding the pedestrian crossover installation report. And further that the Council of the Town of Minto directs staff to proceed with the installation of the level two type B pedestrian crossover as presented at the intersection of Ilora Street South and Young Street in Harriston. Is there anyone opposed? So we would require a mover and seconder for that first, Councillor Dirksen. Oh, yes, you're right. Uh, I probably have that here. Or do I have to take somebody else now? You would have to take, no, you'd have to take two new names because these are two separate new motions. Okay, so uh, Mayor Bridge and Deputy Mayor Tartan. Okay, now is there anyone opposed? Okay, so that carries. And then the second motion, uh, I'll look for a mover for that. You already know what that is. Okay, Mayor Bridge, is there a seconder? Uh, Councillor Gunson? Okay, so this is the second recommendation. Can I ask uh, for a recorded vote, uh, uh, Chair Dirksen? Certainly may. I will read the question and then uh, uh, Clerk McRobb can call our names. Um, the recommendation is that the Council of the Town of Minto direct staff to proceed with the pedestrian crossover painting as a pilot project in recognition, in recognition of the LGBTQ2S plus brackets, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or questioning, and two-spirit, end of brackets, and BIPOC, brackets, black, indigenous, and people of color, end of brackets, communities with funds raised by Community Pride. Uh, sorry, Minto Pride. Almost gave you a new name. <laughs> so through you, count, uh, Councillor Dirksen, I'll go ahead and count for the vote. Councillor okay. McKenzie? Yay or nay? You are uh, muted, sir. Sorry, you are muted, Councillor. Yes. We're going nay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Gunson? Yes. Councillor Elliott? Yes. Councillor Dirksen? No. Councillor Anderson? Yay. Deputy Mayor Turton? Yes. And Mayor Bridge? Yes. And then that's carried. Okay. Thank you, everybody, for the good discussion. And thank you, Mike, for the report. And I will pass the chair back to Mayor thank Bridge. You. Thank you. I didn't go off mute that way, so I didn't get in trouble. There you go. Um, Next up, we have the uh, another, I like this exciting. Um, and I just a little preface to uh, Paul on this. Um, it's funny, Paul, that I was going to talk to you about this because this has come up at FCM. It came up in the Ontario caucus. The Ontario caucus decided that uh, uh, through uh, uh, Councillor in Bradford that we should do a year of, year of the uh, garden and brought it towards to FCM to see if they would uh, push it. And uh, before I had a chance to even do anything, you were on it just like, like anything. And uh, I'm really excited for your presentation today on this. So go ahead, Paul. Hey, thank you for uh, that introduction lead up to it. Sounds like uh, it's already got a little more traction than I maybe anticipated it had. <laughs> uh, so that's good. We're kind of all thinking spring and it's a positive uh, initiative here and it's a, a national thing and encouraging lots of participation um, all over the board with it. So uh, I don't know if uh, I'll, I'll start with uh, just some of the slides that I prepared that just outline the initiative itself. I'll try to be fairly brief with that because it's uh, been a long afternoon already, I think. Uh, and then uh, the- we'll just, We'll just have Quinn bring those up for you first there. Okay. Oh. Sure. And then the end or the, the 
the point or purpose of it is uh, I'm seeking that the, the town makes a proclamation, but I'll, I'll uh, share the background with you first so that uh, we got some of that info to make that decision. So the just while that's coming up too, so the year of the garden, it's a, uh, they was a, pro, a proclamation that was made by the Canadian Garden Council. And uh, it, it's partly inspired by the 100th anniversary of the uh, Um, so uh, they decided to uh, extend a, a welcome to Canadians to look at the positives that uh, go along with gardening and uh, we could probably all come up with several lists or there might be some negatives too like some sore muscles and um, <laughs> sore knees and that sort of thing but uh, there, there's a lot of positives and in light of uh, exiting the pandemic and that I think people are starting to uh, give more credence to the value that outdoor spaces and those sort of activities somewhat meditative and therapeutic in our lives. And so I, I think that's also given uh, some momentum to this movement. Uh, so, so basically it's just encouraging all Canadians to participate in some way. And that will be different for everyone. It depends on, on what your, your space is like, what your skill level is like, uh, your abilities or um, uh, experience. Uh, and uh, not only just reconnecting with nature, but with community too. And that's gonna be a part of, of the experience for a lot of people coming out of um, the habits of, of not socializing and not gathering with groups and organizations we have before. Uh, it's also an opportunity to exercise creativity. We all love those opportunities. You can learn new things at any age from your, your failures or successes. And there's, there's a satisfaction in, in watching something grow and seeing, uh, something quite productive come from something very small or because it's the result of your effort. So it's a rewarding, has the potential to be a rewarding experience. And um, another piece that they're promoting is that we celebrate those people. So they, they could be people who are um, in our horticulture societies or other volunteers in organizations or who are just uh, uh, employed in the horticultural industry. Uh, they could be uh, resources at, uh, garden centers, landscape companies, that sort of thing, but people who share their, their knowledge and uh, move gardening forward for the greater. Um, the next slide there, just a bit of background. Those are some of the sponsors and the media. So uh, I, I just included that to show that it's a, a credible movement. Um, in the next bit, it, I've, I've listed the municipalities there. And this probably is uh, a larger list now than, than when I put this together, when I searched this. So there's beyond 40, municipalities with Canada that have already made that proclamation. And I noticed also in the uh, correspondence that there was uh, that recommendation to us uh, from uh, um, another county in Ontario too. So there, everybody is trying to spur one another on to um, leap forward with this. And there really are only positives uh, as far as I can see. So our, I wanted to bring this to council, but also the, the horticultural societies, both Clifford and Harriston that we have in the municipality are both uh, quite active. Um, they're supporting this as well and, and hoping to uh, uh, use this year as an opportunity to reach out to potential new members and, and rekindle the relationships that their um, current members and former members have. Um, so the, these, sorry, if you want to just slide back a little bit for me, the, the slides I have here in green are just basically how I see this laying out for our municipality. So I'd like to see first, like what we're, what I'm bringing this to council today for is to see the proclamation go ahead. Um, and then I see like these E words to educate, empower and encourage the general public to participate. And that can be as simple as just going out in nature and appreciating what, what's growing, what's blooming, the smells, the sights, the sounds, that sort of thing too. It doesn't mean you need to take on a massive project on your own. Um, and including multiple demographics, that could be all sorts of age groups. So I'd like to see, and I know the horticulture societies will, will um, agree with me on this front, is to try and get the younger folks involved um, and to maybe be pairing those up with people who got experience, who are in different age brackets, also uh, different socioeconomic classes, people who are from different cultural backgrounds. There's, there's a lot of different um, opportunities there. Um, and then I was... Uh, meeting with uh, the team in economic development to see if uh, they're able to help out a little bit, which uh, we're fortunate they're very 
cooperative and um, more than happy to help out with spreading the word where they can and some outreach to the community and foster a bit of friendly competition. So it, it uh, just kind of ups the ante for everyone and makes it that much more uh, engaging. Um, some of the things I see is a social media presence for sure to, to target the, the younger age groups. Um, we, there's some official signage and promotional material I've ordered a bit of that, but also uh, we're gonna see if we can um, come up with some other things that uh, uh, people are able to identify the, the movement and make them uh, a little bit curious and wanna ask some questions and how can they get involved. Uh, a lot of what I see our, our piece being is just uh, connecting different groups and being able to, to get some things going on. It's not necessarily us as the town doing things, but just getting the word out and um, allowing people to, to join forces. Um, I, I'd like to see us piggyback a little bit on some of the events that the town already has going on, and that may be things that uh, economic development has, has planned out. Uh, some, some small materials that people can take home, whether it's some, some magnets or stickers or that sort of thing with contact information or a brief list of, of ways they can participate. And like I said, some contests. And some of those, um, I've already reached out to the agricultural societies and the horticultural societies. Um, we're going to include some classes in their flower shows and their fair um, uh, schedules this year that uh, are um, celebrating the year of the garden. And uh, one of the big, big easy ones that people can get involved in for the garden on any scale is planting red. And that uh, aligns with uh, just a patriotic gesture because uh, it ties in with the, the red and white on the uh, Canadian flag. Um, as far as contests go, I haven't nailed these down 100%. We've done a bit of brainstorming. And so I, um, I can see things such as in the community gardens, we, we're fortunate in our, our town, there's a lot of these things already um, thriving and, and active. So things like our community gardens, um, maybe having a, a, a blind vote where members who are already uh, renters in, at that garden, they at the end of the season all put forth a vote to, to declare who was the, the best uh, plot holder in that community garden. Um, I mentioned the fall fairs and the, uh, the horticultural society shows. Some photography, that's an easy one too, because it, it might be something you did on a very small scale, or it might be something you visited. Um, and then possibly because we've got a lot of um, rural people uh, or rural residences in our, our community, and I know they like to do this sort of thing for the fall fairs and, and uh, other big things like plowing match that perhaps we do a category where it's a, a front gate display that uh, features the color red to tie into the year of the garden. Um, and then I'd mentioned some of these collaborations before. This, this list could go on and on. Um, I was in, in touch with uh, Christian, who's uh, in charge of the after school and the day camp programs, and he's, he's keen. He actually approached me about having uh, some of that youth um, involved in, in a few projects and tasks that uh, get them engaged with, with, with growing things and blooms and whatnot. Um, there, I see opportunities in Palmerston, whether it be in the park or, or some of the, the places that I know, uh, Paul Frain, who is involved with the kelp class and horticulture class at the school, he does a lot of work on his own on some of the, the uh, spaces that, that he's got as teaching gardens across from the high school there, that we could possibly even use um, a link there with uh, drop-in students at the Grove. Uh, the food banks, I um, uh, communicating with them too to see if there's things that either community garden box users could grow or the general public within the municipality could grow that would be useful to them um, as, as produce for users of the food banks. Uh, the farmer's market that's active here too. We can link that together, whether it's some of the, the people who are growing produce or cut flowers. I'd love, another thing I'd love to see is that uh, we're able to, to link some of that to folks who are in long-term care who might have at one point be very active gardeners or appreciated all of that, that we could take in some cut flowers or, or produce of that too. And understandably all of that will uh, play out based on what uh, the limitations are around the pandemic, but we're, we're on the upswing here it looks like. So we're hopefully we can roll with that. And then just kind of my last, uh, my own little interpretation of it, that uh, it's, we think of gardening as all, all the actual things that we're producing and things we're doing, but um this movement of this initiative is really all about the people and getting people connected and the groups going and the fires lit again. And uh, hopefully we, we get some more people involved that, that uh, otherwise might not if we didn't uh, push this idea forward. So it's more about the, the people than it is about pumpkins or the petunias. Sorry about that, uh, Deputy Mayor Turton. <laughs> Uh, 
I don't know, Paul. You're too excited about this. I, <laughs> I was almost going to preface my my presentation with that. Just uh, take it with a grain of salt. <laughs> Who's doing you know what? Uh, no, we 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 enjoy your enthusiasm, and and I, as I said, this project started discussing about uh, six months ago, and uh, it's it's really taken off, and uh, I think it's going to be across Canada. It's going to be really an exciting thing to do, especially coming out of hopefully this pandemic, and we're going to have an opportunity to get out there and socialize and and work together. So, um, I, I just I applaud you for for your slide thing, and I I see all kinds of possibilities and. Uh, it, I know Belinda's excited too because it's, it just fits right into our whole uh, our situation of the culture roundtable. Gene, I mean, this is this is right up our alley in the horticulture society, the egg society. So I'm really excited about it. So, uh, is there any other questions or concerns? I'm gonna I'm gonna make to go ahead, Judy. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm just wondering. Um, well, first of all, uh, my apologies. I don't want to give you an inferiority complex tonight, Paul, but or this afternoon, but apparently I was supposed to chair this part too. <laughs> I was going to say, I think I blew that too. Right? Apparently, yeah, apparently nobody wants to uh, chair Paul Judge's <laughs> presentation. So sorry about that. Um, but anyways, um, I'm wondering, is Communities in Bloom still a thing? It is, it is. And that it's um, not been as, as active because you couldn't uh, do the same sort of things the last couple of years. We, we've decided to take take a little bit of time away from that. Just uh, it's, it. I mean, the, the horticultural aspect is really a small component of it. And um, not that we won't visit that again, but there, it takes a lot of work from a lot of people in yeah. um, researching a lot of stuff and producing documents and housing judges and coordinating tours. And uh, I was fortunate when we did that a few years ago that uh, there's some other members of staff uh, who, who took on a huge amount of work in producing that. And, and for sure we see the value to it, um, but not, not certain that it's something we, that we need to have a, a continual participation in, I guess, we, because a lot of the, the stuff that it's trying to spur on, we, we are already doing. Yes, exactly. I think we learned a lot from it, but I think we've continued to uh, continue to use those learnings too. So, um, so yeah, I would agree. And I really love the idea of having a, an internal, um, you know, I realize it's uh, backed by a bigger organization and so on, but it feels like it's uh, our own little project here in Minto and, and I think it'll be great. Looking forward to it and I appreciate your enthusiasm as well. Yeah. All right, Judy, go ahead and finish off. I, I, I got carried away because of the, the fact oh. that I'm excited about this. Yeah. Well, it yeah. Okay. It doesn't matter that much, but okay. Oh. Uh, Councilor Anderson, go ahead. You are muted, Councillor Anderson. Oh, you're still muted. Sorry, I was hitting on the wrong button. Um, my apologies for that. But Paul and I have been talking about this and uh, Vic Palmer, who's also the president of the Clifford Society, we think this is a great opportunity to sort of, as Paul says, rejuvenate some interest in, in horticulture and planting and growing and working together as people. And during this pandemic, there has been a tremendous growth and in interest in house plants in particular and growing your own food. The two mm -hmm. things that we see have really, so we're hoping we can attract some youth with those projects. So um, my my ask here is to people, if you have an idea of something, we're trying to come up with a garden of the year and whether it's something, we'd like to get the community more involved. We've tried a few times with the Hort Society to get people to nominate gardens for our garden of the month, but we're not very successful with it. Um, but we need people to think about that, to acknowledge the extra mile that some people go on their gardens or the community flower beds or, and kudos to you, Paul, the towns have looked phenomenal the last few years, whether we're participating in communities in bloom or not. You've done a tremendous job of sort of bringing things together, coordinating them. And just you guys watch out for the color combination this year, cause it's gonna wow you. It'll be grand. And think oh. red for your flower beds. Think it, I think it's already on the alert. They know to plant red. <laughs> they have red flowers. So it, it, it's gonna be really exciting and the town will look totally amazing, but it has for the, past several years with all of this work. Community in Bloom started something really good, but as Paul says, we're already doing a lot of that. They're looking at a lot of environmental concerns and we're very progressive there 
already. So it's a good news story all the way around. Okay, is there anyone else with any questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll read the recommendation. It's moved by Councillor McKenzie and seconded by Councillor Elliott that the Council of the Town of Minto proclaim 2022 as the year of the garden. Is there anyone opposed to that? I didn't think so. Okay, that carries. Thank you. Good luck, Paul. Now I'll pass the chair back to Mayor Bridge. Uh, sorry about that. I really messed that up. Well, I, I didn't mess the first one up. I messed that one up, Judy. I apologize. Um, anyways, uh, I've got this a little bit backwards here. In my uh, e-scribe, I've got the next item not being the year in review. Did you want to do that first, uh, Belinda? And then and then we'll go to the two other um, the other uh, things that you have. I'd rather have you do the year, year in review <clears throat> first, I think. Oh. That's right. You want me to do the year in review before the development charge deferral request? Yeah, because I've got it both ways. I've got it in my notes here that you're going to do the uh, year, the Great Canadian Homes one first, and then year in review. Yes. For you, Mayor Bridge, that is, that is the order of the agenda, is the Great Canadian Homes first for the deferral. Cool, yeah. Okay. All right. Then they do that one first. Sure. Yeah, it's quick. <laughs> or it should be. We'll see. <laughs> long meeting today. Um, okay, so as you recall, in December, we sold uh, 345 Minto Road to Golden Canadian Homes. And um, in January, we received a request to defer de development charges until 50% of the building was occupied. Now we have done deferral um, agreements in the past. Uh, CREDAC uh, development is the most recent. Uh, but what we did with that agreement, instead of them paying DCs upon receiving their building permit, they will pay the full DCs upon occupancy of the first unit. Um, so we were comfortable with doing that. Um, this is a little bit different, obviously, at this only having, or not only, but waiting until 50% of the uh, facility is occupied before collecting DCs. Um, so that is there for, I guess, council to discuss. Um, in terms of the financial considerations, we will get the DCs, but who knows when that will be, when 50% will be occupied. And um, the loss of revenue would be from interest charges that you would normally charge um, on DC deferrals. So I don't have anything more to add unless Treasurer Duff has anything he wants to add from a treasury side of things. Or did you have any? Um, yeah, as Belinda said, you're not in the habit of doing this type of deferral. Um, I, I think the the first unit one, uh, hopefully it's not too long. As like normal practices, the DCs are all due when you pick up the building permit. And in general, uh, especially on the uh, commercial and industrial side, Minto is just a flow through. So we still have to pay, um, you know, the county development charges, and uh, uh, if there there aren't normally education, but we pay them too if they were there. Um, yeah, I'm I'm not real comfortable with this request um, because the first unit you kind of have an idea when it's going to happen. Like normally we've got covenants that you must bill within one year. Um, to say the least, we're living in uncertain times. So what happens, I don't know, so say it's eight units and they occupy three of them and all of a sudden interest rates go up and they can't sell the last one. So we've paid all the development charges to the upper tier and we're holding on in hopes of reaching that 50%. So I don't know, I, I think it just leaves the taxpayers at a bit of risk, but... Uh, of course, we'll go with whatever council decides. Uh, Judy? So would it be more palatable if there was a, a time limit on it as well? So 50% uh, or, I don't know, 24 a month, whichever comes first, or something like that. Would that be helpful to them and yet give us a little bit more security? 
I don't know who I'm asking. Yeah, I was going to say treasure death. <laughs> yeah, right. um, yeah, and it, it's better than completely open ended. Um, again, it, it's more what are you comfortable with? And as we say, we get a lot of requests, uh, and I think we're going to get more uh, for that first unit deferral. And uh, I know just talking with staff, that's the one we're kind of more comfortable with. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's correct. <laughs> it, it, it is better, but but not ideal. So, so Derek, you want to speak to this? Because what I think what you're recommending, Glenda, is you're recommending to do what we've done with the previous one, which is the first first unit. I totally agree. I, I mean, I don't think we should be doing this one, but Derek, did you want to speak to that? Because I think we're getting like, we, we want to help out the developer as best we can, but we don't want to be open-ended here. Is that right? Yeah. Thank, thank you, Mayor Bridge, to, uh, to Councillor Dirksen. Uh, as, as Treasurer Duff has suggested, we, we are uncomfortable with this because the developer controls occupancy. So, it's open ended and we're we're uncomfortable with it and we want to continue like we're okay with with the first one and I think that's consistent with what we've done in before and that's the way we'd like to continue. We would not like to adjust that at all, to be honest. Um, we believe there's it's risky. Um, and then if we start deviating from that, the next one could be 75% or, or something deviating from what we really want to do, which is first unit occupancy. That is already a break from building permit. So I don't I don't think we're being unrealistic in wanting to stay to what we believe is is fair, but not risking to our organization or the taxpayers. Yeah. So are we going back, Derek, just sort of before Jean, are we going back and telling them we're not we not want to do this one, but they may want to come back with the initial like if they want to go the other route we uh, through, through you or through you uh mayor bridge to I, i'm getting confused who i'm going through here now but that's okay um yes yeah, so we we certainly would would tell them that council declined this one and but they're if they want to submit one under first unit then we'd be happy to bring that one back right right that's what i thought we were working on today go yeah. ahead dean so I I don't think we should consider this at all, but my other question is, why is he bringing this up now? Like if people want a deferral on the development charges, shouldn't that be charged part of the initial offer? And whether we need to refine that to people? Now, I'm, I don't do your job, I don't know that, mm -hmm. but if it was me doing this, um, I'd be going, uh, if you want special consideration, that needs to be brought up in the initial offer. Because we have enough requests for this land. It's not like we're, we're desperate to sell the land. We're desperate to find more land. So I don't see why we would bend over backwards at all here. We're not. I don't think, Gene. That's what we're saying. We don't want to do this. But I think, can we not clarify, like, he bought this or took ownership a month ago, and then he says, oh, by the way, oh, don't yeah, I so can't pay my development charges until I'm half full. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, go ahead. That, that's yeah. not cool. Uh, I don't with, think. Um, the Credac. One, if you recall, their DC deferral was a part of their agreement of purchase and sale. Um, and so we had negotiated that as part of the agreement sure. of purchase and sale. So, yes, we were a little surprised after the fact to receive the request. And we did say that we've never done this before. and We wouldn't suggest that be the request, but he wanted us to still bring that forward. So okay. that's well. what we're doing. <laughs> So that's that's what we're going to vote up in on your today. First sentiments, yeah. <laughs> no way. Yeah. At least uh, in my opinion, I don't see the point of it. So, what is the recommendation? I have to look at that. There isn't there, one. There isn't one, right? So, three U Mayor Bridge. The recommendation is just, just yeah, and provide staff direction to staff that the request be declined would be the that's, ending of the recommendation. That, that's what I thought. They receive the report and the. Provide direction to staff that the request be declined. Yep. Okay. So that's on the table. And move with Councillor Elliott and second is Deputy Mayor Turton. That's right. So is anybody opposed to that? That's carried. So we'll send you, Belinda, you can talk to them. Go, go ahead from there. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Okay. Now the exciting part. Tried to get this in first. Good. 
Yeah. <laughs> Actually, see, the problem is Quinn's numbers are different, Annalene, than my numbers on my computer. So that was why I was getting a little confused. Okay, so the year in review is a number three and mine was number four in, in the actual thing. Okay, right. go ahead, Belinda, this is exciting stuff. I always enjoy your year in review. Go okay, ahead. so if we can just get Summer and Aaron promoted as well as always, we're gonna do this as a TED team and we are going to fly through this. We understand it's been a long meeting and there's still more to come. So um, excuse us for fast talking and only going high level, but we do have hard copies of this for all council members. So we will share it and you obviously have the electronic copy. So um, I'm gonna jump right in. This is our 2021 year in review. You can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, this is our uh, main page here of all highlighting all the committees. So even though the last year was another COVID year, we still were able to work with all of the different committees. And as you can see there, there's 27 that the three of us are engaged in. And also wanted to highlight um, that last year, the Minto Chamber and the town uh, worked together and produced um, two coupon books one that came out in the summer and one that came out during the Christmas season. There were 33,000 copies that were distributed across the region. And I'll turn it over to Erin to talk about some of the events. Uh, yeah, so despite uh, just being another COVID year, we were still able to put together 61 uh, different events, um, whether they were in person online. So that includes 52 that we did downtown, uh, two cultural volunteer support webinars and seven uh, launch it webinars. And you can go to the next slide. Yep. And um, so this slide is all about industrial development and our CIP program. So I want to acknowledge the support from the building department and all of our efforts on both of these. Um, as you know, we work closely with Terry, Dave, Ashley, and Wes. Um, so shout out to them. Uh, you know that we did uh, 26.1 acres that were sold, another four and a half that are pending. Um, quite a few commercial permits, eight and eight industrial permits of quite high value. Uh, in terms of our community improvement plan, we did nine grants um, totaling almost 60,000 and one of our businesses was able to secure 20,000 from the County of Wellington. Next slide. Um, where your family belongs initiative. So we were able to do some pop-up newcomers receptions. Um, looking forward to getting back to the normal newcomer receptions this year. We also did our move to Minto video production and began work on launching that for this year. As you know, um, sadly, we had to host the Solidarity March um, from bad circumstances, but it became a, a great event where our community rallied together to show support for our Syrian, Syrian families. Um, we also are involved with obviously the Health Professional Recruitment Group and are excited to see the uh, Harrison uh, Lions Medical Center expansion happen this year. So engage with that as well. Next slide. And over to Summer. Great. Uh, so the next two slides actually are all about getting money back into the community and different ways that um, the town and the chamber partner together to do that. So the first one, this one here, Locally Loyal Minto, we kicked that off several years ago, but we hosted several uh, social media contests as well as giveaways and events in the downtowns. Uh, we gave away approximately $3,500 in Locally Loyal dollars that people can redeem at local businesses throughout Minto, as well as various swags, uh, swag stuff and uh, we also gave away as prizing and contest $2,500 in uh, Think Minto First gift cards. So next slide. So Think Minto First has been a huge success. We've always done the fundraiser portion of Think Minto First for the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, from 2019 to 2021, uh, $75,000 in gift cards have been sold to local businesses, uh, fundraising approximately $19,000 for local community groups and organizations that run this program. Um, it is available to any, any organization, not-for-profit organization that would like to host this fundraiser. It's a great way to keep money back in the community. Um, we have, or oh, Mental Chamber of Commerce has approximately 260 uh, members, which represents well over 55% of the Minto business community, which we are thrilled and like to brag about. 
Uh, over the past year, we've delivered over 15,000 rapid test kits to local businesses uh, through that program uh, through the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. So that was great. We received uh, $95,000 in shop local grant money uh, to be able just to promote shopping local throughout the pandemic and beyond. Um, we had seven grand openings uh, in 2021 and 64 grand openings since 2014. So yay Minto. Next slide. Uh, so launch it. We have uh, really been doubling down on our partnerships that we have amazing partnerships with the business, business center, Guelph, Wellington, Saugeen Economic and, and more. Um, we were able to host 50 virtual events uh, because of our partnership with the business center. Um, and there was over a thousand views of those recorded events that we uh, hosted in different workshops and various training um, training programs. Um, Minto saw 1,542 attendees, or sorry, Launch It saw 1,542 attendees uh, through the doors for various meetings and, and virtually, of course. Uh, everything is, you know, kind of hybrid this past year. Uh, we have some really great tenants. We have Betty McTagg, who's the cropitist. She is here two days a week. Uh, Melissa Miller is the uh, dental hygienist out in front. Infrastructure Ontario service um, and the digital service squad, as well as student study space uh, and a few others that we have new tenants in the in the building. So we're keeping very busy here. Next slide. So uh, we hosted four Minto Makers Markets uh, in 2021, and we have a, a growing network of over, over 60 makers. Uh, we're really thrilled about that. We look forward to hosting more of those maker markets uh, in 2022. Uh, iHub, uh, the, our, food, our food future circular food economy continues uh, to roll along and we are a main door in that and so we're thrilled to be partnered with that. Digital Main Street 3.0 was a huge success in 2021. We had eight, not Minto, sorry, Northern Wellington County had 89 businesses uh, receive the grant uh, totaling $222,500. Um, so that made a huge impact on our downtowns and the businesses and the way that they uh, interact digitally with the community. So we're thrilled about that. And uh, the partnership, Northern Wellington Economic Development Partnership continues to be strong um, with Mapleton, Wellington North and uh, Minto. So thrilled about that. Uh, for Hairston Rising and our downtown groups, uh, some of the highlights um, included the completion of lots of beautification projects this year. Um, so we have like decorative pole wraps, installation of information kiosks and pers parking signage and um, the mural on the Harrison food land. Um, they hosted lots of different events. So there was um, ones like ha Halloween Haunt, which was hugely successful. They had a few smaller events over the summer, like tie dye and trivia and Sundays on Sunday. And then the holiday events like ladies night and um, Candyland Christmas, which is new this year. They currently have 11 committee members and the online presence continues to grow with 1,073 followers on Instagram. Uh, next slide. Um, all aboard Palmerston who has 14 members right now and 839 Instagram followers and they also now have a Facebook page. So they're growing as well. Um, they also completed many of the same beautification projects as Harrison. Um, as well as installation of the mural on the Lions Club shed. And they also um, worked with the Lions Club for lights on the train and the bridge and the pavilion and railway station. This committee also held lots of different events like tiny trains and treats. They had a hypnotist in, and then also the widely attended um, Light Up the Park and Chris Kringle Market, which were huge successes as well. Uh, next slide. And then Clifford Connects has um, 11 committee members and they also completed lots of the same projects as well with the info kiosks and parking signages. Um, the site plan this was also developed for Clifford Celebration Square and um, they also applied for a couple of grants to re help receive with the funding for that. And the committee also held Clifford Christmas in the street in partnership with Minto Fire um, and the Santa Claus Parade, which overall was really um, positive and well attended. Uh, next slide. For our RED project, 2021 wrapped up our two-year program and the highlights that we uh, worked on last year were the information kiosks, which are just waiting for their cork board, uh, the wayfinding signs for all three towns in their parking, uh, as Aaron mentioned, the new pool wrap, 
uh, the railway themed lights in Palmerston and the cute little entrance enhancements that were done. Uh, you know all about the um, projects that were done the year before. You can go to the next slide. And uh, yeah, this is just, again, a shout out to all the clubs and businesses that contributed and helped us access that grant money. Next slide. Uh, the Railway Museum, another uh, tough year of not being able to open um, very much, but we did still have in less than two months, 494 visitors. Saturdays are our busiest day of the week. Obviously, the farmer's market helps with that. Our students did a great job accessioning over 1,200 items. And since we started that project, we're approaching 4,000, looking forward to getting near that completion. And as you can see there, we worked with the um, farmer's market and thanks to county funding, we're able to get uh, signage for the museum, which it's never had before. I'll turn it over to Erin for the farmer's market update. Um, yeah, so the farmer's market was well attended throughout the season uh, with 2,287 families or groups coming uh, throughout the season. COVID again prevented any in-person events this year too, but we did a lot of other kind of initiatives this year, which included like newsletters. We started a pre-order service for people not comfortable coming to the market, hosted contests. We recognized musicians with um, spotlights instead of inviting them to come we just uh, on social media. And we partnered with Wellington County Taste Trail to sell market bucket boxes and advertise the market trail, which um, has eight markets throughout Wellington County. And then, yeah, throughout the season, our social media presence also continued to grow with 996 uh, Facebook page likes. Next slide. Our Sogging Connect partnership continues to grow. So that's the Sogging Economic Development and member municipalities include Brockton, Hanover, Minto, Wellington, Northwest Gray, Erin Eldersley, South Ruth, and Mapleton is involved with the WOWSA project specifically. Uh, during this time, we were able to acquire red funding of almost $20,000 that allowed us to do a succession um, planning webinar series, as well as a women's um, advancing women economically series. We had 19 people uh, benefit from the succession uh, series and 23 women participated in the WOWSA Awe program. Uh, student, Summer Student Startup is also one of those programs. We had 59 youth operate 50 businesses in the region and eight of those were from Minto last year. Next slide and over to Erin. Um, yes, so the Minto Cultural Roundtable worked on volunteer organization support um, this year as well. So with this included um, funding Zoom Pro accounts for 15 different um, volunteer organizations, providing uh, PP and promotion and advertising support um, so they could apply to through grants, um, as well as training webinars, volunteer spotlights on social media, and help with volunteer recruitment via our online uh, portal, volunteer portal, and a few other things. Uh, we also celebrated five different Minto women who are recognized as outstanding uh, women and leaders in our community for International Women's Day, which you can see the five we celebrated there. Uh, next slide. Um, so in 2021, Minto Youth Action Council started up again after taking a bit of a break during uh, the COVID lockdown. And um, now we meet out of the Grove, the Grove in Palmerston, which is the youth hub there. And we've just been working in uh, 21 on rebuilding um, with new members, including updating our mandate and vision to realign with the new youth um, and hosting a few different events like a costume swap and an outdoor games night. Um, and as well as we've been volunteering and assisting um, with other community groups. Uh, so next slide. Um, this just shows that the town of Minto's online presence continues to grow. So we have 406 um, more um, followers on our three main platforms, which is Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And altogether, we manage about 17 different accounts, um, which includes accounts for our downtown committees, Minto, Makers, Youth, the Museum, et cetera. Uh, next slide. Yes, in terms of presentations in 2021, we were thrilled to be asked by OMAFRA to present to their um, fundamentals team on downtown revitalization and the efforts that we've undertaken in Minto with the help of their programs over the number of years we've been involved. We were also um, locally loyal Minto was actually featured in an Ontario ECDEV responses to COVID-19 report that was commissioned by EDCO, as well as in the COVID-19 and rural impact and rural economic development can impact responses and recovery. So we were a uh, shout out in those things. Also um, last year, I continued on the EDCO board as secretary and also the chair of the 2021 conference. 
and looking forward to uh, 2022 being the treasurer as well as the co-chair of the conference this year. Next slide, please. So yeah, just a shout out to our amazing team. Um, Aaron, who joined us as a mat leave and now is permanently with us. Um, covering for Taylor uh, Summer at Launch in the Chamber, obviously great partnership with them. Ashley Noble was our Digital Main Street uh, Service Squad member and did a great job, as you can see, from the grants. And um, as you know, work in ActDev and community development is not in a silo, and we have to give thanks to all the other departments um, for helping us out with all the things that they do um, across all the, all the things. So Thanks to everybody, and as always, thanks to Council for your continued support of our, of our efforts. Thanks, Belinda, and uh, amazing. Yeah, I'll give it you know, and to your staff. And, and uh, when I, I see that, when I, I read that report, and I, I did read it uh, beforehand, and you went really fast on it, but that's all right. But uh, that that's a great document, and that really shows. I mean, so much that goes on, and and why why Minto is so successful, and why this council is so proud of of you and your group. Uh, um, everywhere I go, we I get uh, compliments about Minto and, and our economic development. So, uh, kudos to you. Any questions or concerns or comments? That's all right. All right Judy, go ahead. Oh, you're, yeah, you're, you're good. You're good. Yeah, my, my finger missed it the first time around. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mayor Bridge. Uh, yeah, congratulations uh, to all of you um, for uh, that great report. It, uh, it's really neat to see all of that happening. Um, the Think Mental First uh, program, I, I just think that is such a big boost for our community. Um, love to see how we could uh, expand that or, or uh, make people more aware of it. I don't know. I think some people are afraid they're going to lose the, the gift cards or something maybe, or the certificates. Uh, I'm not sure what the, I'm not sure what the holdup is on that, but um, I certainly take really good advantage of, of that uh, program and I really like it. And I also love all the partnerships that you talked about throughout your presentation and uh, you know, everything is pretty tightly woven together. And that's kind of what I, that's how I, I kind of picture all of these, uh, all of these things. Um, I have noticed our entrance signs are showing a bit of wear where you seem to be losing that blue hoop over the top. Um, is there any guarantee on those or? Um, so, can you it? hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay, my, I, my ear pods are dying. <laughs> um, so yet yeah, the warranty is now over on those signs, but, but they do know that, that ha those have fallen off. And we're just waiting for them to come and fix them. Okay. But yes, the warranty is up. Yeah, perfect. Well, they're certainly uh, uh, beautiful signs and very, um, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, but they're very impressive signs anyways. They look really good. And thanks, Judy, for the comment on the partnership. I think that's something that we pride ourselves on in Minto is collaboration and partnerships. And that's why we're successful because we're all working together to go in the same direction. And it's really important and something that other communities don't have. So we're very fortunate. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Councillor Elliott. Melinda and you and your staff are just, you're, you're, you're ahead of the box and everything we do. Um, I'm very, very proud of what you do, uh, including like tonight, our inclusive uh, community. I mean, we're way ahead of Wellington County when we do that kind of thing. We've always been that way. And uh, one of the questions in our economic development is, what would you do to improve economic development in, in uh, um, mental? And I just said, how can we beat what we got? You know, you guys are ahead of the box. I appreciate what you're doing. Phenomenal, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Councillor Elliott. Appreciate your support. Deputy Mayor Turt. Yeah, same here, uh, Belinda, Summer, Aaron. Uh, that was an amazing report and so colorful. And all the work that you guys do in our community, thank you. That's all Aaron's magic. So yeah. <laughs> thanks to her for making us look good. <laughs> yeah. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, everyone. Everyone. thanks, thanks for that, Belinda. Okay, moving on. I've got uh, Ashley and this is uh, on the Dobson consent severance. Uh, Ashley, go ahead. Perfect. There she is. 
Uh, so this severance is for the Dobson property at 5924 Wellington Road 123 in Palmerston. So the owner is proposing to sever off the prime agricultural portion of the property from the remainder of the property that is designated as industrial. So the severed prime egg portion is around 35 acres and the retained portion, which is industrial, is around 41 acres. The portion that's being severed off is actually outside of the urban boundary and it does have existing access off of Highway 23. So town staff note that the severance will permit for the potential of one detached dwelling um, so long as it meets the agricultural setback provisions and it will have to abide by the natural environment setbacks as well. Um, that being said, council may recall the front of this property being brought before them regarding a site plan agreement on the highway commercial portion that abuts um, Wellington Road 123 and the severance will not impact that area. Town staff are recommending that council recommend the approval of the severance to the land division committee with the conditions outlined in the report. Questions? Pretty straightforward. It goes to land division now and uh, it goes from there. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now there's a long recommendation there with all kinds of things. Do we want to assume everybody's read that? Is that good? Okay, I'll make the, I'll, I'll do it this way. Uh, moved by Councillor McKenzie and second by Councillor Dirksen, the Council of Town of Minnow recommends the County of Wellington Land Division Committee approve the consent application uh, for B722 Dobson Brothers Enterprise Limited for land legally described as part lot 25 concession one with a municipal address of 5924 Wellington Road 123 in the Town of Minto and the following conditions be considered. And then I'll let you, I'm not gonna read all those conditions if that's all right. Uh, anybody opposed? That is carried. Okay. Next up, Ashley, you got another one. My last one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one more. Uh, so the severance is for Knox Presbyterian Church in Palmerston. So they are looking at severing off the existing church from the manse. When you look at county mapping and the roll number, it appears that it's two parcels, but their lawyer did do a title search and it indicates that it is one. So the severance is to simply split it into two legal parcels. Um, standard conditions we're recommending apply relating to access and servicing and public work staff have um, reviewed current records and it indicates that the church and the house actually share a water service and they're currently working to confirm if this is also the case for sanitary. So to address this, we have included a recommended condition that individual services be provided for both lots to the town's satisfaction. The thought is that there is potential to enter into a servicing agreement to connect when Main Street is reconstructed. Um, to do this, we would require 100% deposit of the estimated cost for the offsite and onsite works. However, this can be addressed as a condition and we are satisfied with that. Um, so we are recommending that council recommend the approval of the severance to the land division committee um, with the recommended conditions in the report. Thank you. And I'll put the, I'll put the recommendation up there and, and uh, Councillor Gunson had to leave us. So I need a, a mover for that. If I can get a mover, Deputy Mayor Turton, second by Councillor Elliott. The Council of Town of Minto recommends the County of Wellington Land Division Committee approve the consent application for B1722 trustees of the congregation uh, of Knox Church for legal land legally described as part lot 65, 66, and 71 for Othrix Wicks survey in the town of, town of Palmerston, Town of Minto, County of Wellington, and the following conditions be considered. And you heard the conditions, especially the one about the services. Um, has anybody got any questions on that? If not, uh, anybody opposed? That is carried. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Through you, Mayor Bridge, sorry. I sorry, don't believe sorry. that there was a motion made for the year in review for the economic development. Um, oh, did we not do and that? I know Councillor uh, Gunson was a mover on that one as well. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. So I can have a mover in a sector for that, uh, Deputy Mayor Turton and Councillor McKenzie. Anybody opposed? That's carried. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Anderson will take the chair now. Go ahead, Councillor Anderson. I'm, I'm getting better as we go along. I'm not messing up as much. Thank you, Mayor Bridge. And I'm looking for, oh, there he is, Chris there. Um, I will turn it over to Chris Harrow to give his report. One is on mandatory certifications. And then there's another item following that. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, I just the first report that I wanted to bring to council today, and I, I know it's been a long meeting, but I wanted to uh, just bring it to your attention that <clears throat> the province has introduced draft regulations, which um, look like they're gonna be ratified very, very soon. 
um, to introduce firefighter mandatory certifications. So essentially what it means is um, if you choose to perform uh, a service with the fire department for your municipality, the firefighters must be certified um, through the certifying body, which is the fire marshal's office for each of the tasks that you're doing. So for example, our water rescue team would need to be certified um, to NFPA standards. Right now they're trained and, and they, they take the course, but they, they, um, there actually was no standard applicable. But now they brought the standards in or are bringing the standards in, we would have to be certified to that level. Um, and it goes for all other things. If you operate a pumper truck, you have to be certified. If you are a, an officer, a captain, you have to be certified. Um, so it's, it's coming and uh, we have been preparing for quite a few years for this. So I feel like we're in good shape um, for this to be implemented. Um, it's one of the reasons why we got the modernization money to, to improve on our record keeping and, and be able to keep better records and better uh, uh, lesson planning for training and that kind of stuff. Um, it's the reason that we've added to our staff in the past. It's, it's, it's all that stuff so that we can be prepared to be ready for this implementation. So um, just wanted to make sure this was on council's radar and, and if there was any questions that I could answer them before uh, the regulations become in, uh, come into effect. Thank you, Chris. Uh, questions, Mayor, Deputy Mayor Turton. Thank you, uh, Chair Anderson. So the, uh, the the water rescue, our standards of the, uh, how our guys have been and gals have been uh, certified and then the NAF, uh, the NAFA standard. Uh, is there a lot of difference, Chris? No, the, the standards that we were training to before were the NFPA standards. Um, just Ontario hadn't adopted those fully yet. Uh, so they're going to have to adopt it and then the, they will put out the standards that, that is, as the applicable to them. So then it's a matter of us uh, just training, making sure we're training that standard, which we already are, and but then completing a written and practical exam that's approved by NFPA. So it's just taking a step further, more or less, in writing a written exam and performing practical examinations to show that we're, we're certified to that standard. Liability? Um, there is going to be increased liability if we don't train to the standards for sure. Um, and like there's, there's a couple other legislation pieces coming down. The fire service is, <laughs> is changing rapidly and, um, we're trying to stay on top of it, but, uh, there's a community risk assessment document that will need to be done. And so you, you identify the risks in your community, you tie that to the services that you offer, and then you tie that back to your establishing and regulating bylaw that we have approved and councils, all that data that we're going to have and that we're collecting now with our new software and, and have been through the years, but we presented to council to say, here's our data, here's our call volumes, here's our risks. Now, what services do we want to offer as a municipality? And it'll come down to that we can't offer every single service out there, um, but you know, what can we afford? What can we do? And what can we expect of the volunteers? Because there's so much expectations placed on them already. So. Wow. Hmm. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Mayor Bridge? Yes, Jean, and uh, through you, um, I, I just wanna give Chris a lot of credit. I, he brought this to us again to show us. I mean, Chris, I tell you, I, I hear when I'm out there, some municipalities have, aren't ready for this. They're, they're gonna be in trouble. Uh, you've been training your people on this going forward. We talked about this years ago and that we knew it was probably gonna get here eventually. And uh, I give you a lot of credit for, especially the young people that are coming on the service, they're getting trained properly and you're keeping the record keeping, which is very important, which a lot of, a lot of organizations won't be able to have, won't have that. So I think you put us in pretty good shape uh, through you, Councilor Anderson and in your department there that we're not gonna get caught blindsided for sure. This might be a situation where we'll have to figure out what we can afford, what we can't afford and, and go from there. But uh, we certainly know what's coming and uh, we're better prepared for it than most. Thank you. Any other questions? No, and there wasn't a recommendation there, was there? Oh, yeah. just that we received the report. Fire 2022-003 regarding firefighter mandatory cert certifications for information. 
And I don't know if I had a mover and a seconder because I can't look at all these different screens. For you, Councillor Anderson, it would be Councillor Dirksen and seconded by Councillor McKenzie. Perfect. Anybody in opposition to this? That's passed then. And the second report is the year in review, I gather. Yes, Councillor Anderson. Yeah, and uh, there it is. Um, I'll just get going to scroll through the slides fairly really quickly because I don't need to go through it all. You've had it and I know you've had a chance to look at it. It's more or less just showing you our statistics for the year and um, where our call volume is, which is holding really steady. Um, so you can keep going on the slides. Um, our call volume is is uh, been steady around the 200 mark, um, which is, is good. Um, we're not doing like an, an extraordinary amount of calls all of a sudden. Um, so that's good. This slide is, we have hired 11 new recruits. So they are starting right now, which is the biggest hiring we've had for a long time. Um, but that's just due to different retirements and, and people moved away. So they're in the process, um, you can keep going. Um, there's our call volume has been broken down by type. We're always in the unique spot in Minto that we aren't overly burdened with uh, medical calls uh, compared to some departments that do 70 to 80%. It's fairly split between fires, motor vehicle accidents, medical calls, and um, false alarm calls. They're all right around the same in the 30 percentage mark. So um, we're, we're fairly consistent that way. Um, you can keep going. Uh, there's our historicals. You can see we're, we're hovering around, we're just hovering around the 200 mark. Um, so no drastic jumps. We're still working on fire prevention, even though it's COVID and, and Cam has done a great job getting out and doing that. We hopefully can make that a little more proactive in the future. Um, but again, that'll be looking at our community risk assessment, which you'll see that later. Keep next slide. Um, we didn't, aren't able to get out to do in-person public education activities. We did a whole bunch of virtual ones. But you can see the first one was the, or the best one was the scavenger hunt we did virtually that had 1,810 contest entries, which was huge. So really well done. Um, we're still training. We're still keeping everyone up. And kudos to firefighters who had to adapt a lot this year from in-person to online, back to in-person and back to online. So they did really well. Next slide. Some of the projects completed, the softwares, tablets are in place. The Clifford Fire Hall renovation was completed. We did a, a huge inventory project and we worked on our mapping with Guelph Dispatch. So um, that was done. There's a picture of the new Clipper Fire Hall and the conceptual drawing that's done, which we will hopefully someday be able to get a well, council up to see it. Uh, the new tanker truck is being purchased as we speak from last council meeting. We're just gonna start soon and looking how we can renovate the Palmerston station. It'll be the last hall to get the renovation that we need to do be done. Um, next slide. They talk, talked about the 11 new recruits. And now with all this new legislation and the new community risk assessment that we're gonna to have to look at our master fire plan and bring it back to council uh, eventually to show um, how we're going to meet all of the risks that we've identified and how we can meet this new firefighter standard standardization, training standardization. So next slide. Um, we're gonna prepare for a huge purchase for our SCB upgrade in 2023. And then we're gonna continuously look at our new software systems and how we can continue to upgrade that to make life easier around here for the volunteers and for the management. Um, and we're in the process of doing interviews this week to replace um, Cleese for her maternity leave on that uh, year long contract. So hopefully that will go well and we'll be able to, uh, to have a replacement in place for her to keep moving forward during that year. Any questions? Um, I don't see any questions, but I would just like to extend a message of thanks to you and Khalees and every, all of the deputy chiefs for the work you do and mostly the volunteer firefighters. It's been quite a two years going with COVID and all the extra precautions and extra calls for things. And goodness knows as somebody who's involved in that healthcare system, if we didn't have our firefighters and our paramedics helping us out there the community would be in a bad way. Not we in the hospital so much, but we count on you guys to be there and get there and do things. And and once again, unfortunately, David and I have had a chance to experience your care <laughs> firsthand. And as tragic as the circumstances are, you guys are there, you're taking care of things, you're on top of things, and, and you're there to sort of console people as they're looking at tragedies uh, that are happening right in front of their eyes. 
that they have no control over. I, I just can't say enough for what it, it takes a toll on you and your workers. It takes a toll on you every time you get called out. And this testing, I'm a little concerned about what it's going to do to some people, because even though they have the knowledge, they hate tests. So it's going to be a challenge to get your 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 members to go through that. But it's the way of the world nowadays. But and they have the knowledge. It's unfortunate the tests don't always capture the knowledge that they have because some people just don't do tests well. But I'm sure you'll get them through there just fine. Um, and a necessary service for the town and the community, because without that certification, I'm sure insurance would become almost untenable for most uh, organizations to contemplate. So kudos again, and uh, thanks for all the hard work you do and good luck to the new recruits. Thanks, Councilor Anderson. I'll be sure to pass that on. Thank you very much. Good work. Any other comments, folks? No, so do I have a recommendation here or did we just- You have do, to watch? Oh, Councilor I do. Anderson. The Council of the Town of Minto received report Oh no, I'm looking at the old one. The search. Sorry, I'm at the other one. Just a minute while I get through to all these things. And we will need a mover as Councillor Gunson was slated to move that and he is no longer here. This meeting. I keep it keeps wanting to go back to the certification. Would you like me to read it out for you? Sure, that would be lovely because mine just won't stay on Certainly. it. Uh, the motion is that council receives report fire 2022-004 regarding the 2021 year in review as information. So you would require a new mover for Could that. I have a mover for that. Oh, Mayor Bridge. And is seconded by Deputy Mayor Turton. Perfect. Anybody in op opposition to that? Seeing none, that is passed as well. And thank you so much, Chris, for the report. And I'll pass the chair back to Mayor Bridge. Thanks, Councillor Anderson. And I've got uh, two more reports to do here, and uh, I'll have Quinn do the first one. And it's, uh, go ahead, Quinn. All right, uh, so through you, Mayor Bridge, I just have a quick report for you today regarding the period of restricted acts as set out in the Municipal Act, which prohibits certain actions in an election year when it is determined that there will be what is known as a material change in the membership of council during the next term of office. In this instance, a material change occurs when the new council is made up of less than 75% of its current membership. Since our council is relatively small with only seven members, for us, a material change would be less than six members of council returning to the desk in 2023. So council may enter a restricted acts period or become a lame duck council on one of two days in 2022. The first being August 19th when nominations close. This would occur if less than six of our current council chooses to seek reelection. Or on October 24th, once the votes are counted, if less than six of our current members are reelected. If either of those situations were to arise, council would be prohibited from making new decisions on certain matters until the end of the council term, which in this case would be November 14th. That brings me to the next part of my report, which is about the delegation of authority bylaw. In the 2018 election, council chose to delegate the authority to act in a restricted acts period to the CAO, meaning CAO Thompson would have the authority to act on those matters that you are restricted from acting on should we go into lame duck. Our previous delegation of authority bylaw did not include this delegation, but a majority of municipalities have gone to including this in their regular delegation of authority bylaw to ensure that the municipality can continue to run in an efficient manner in an election year should lame duck occur. And while updating the bylaw to include this, notice that it hasn't been updated since 2018. So we reviewed it and updated some of the formatting to make things easier to find, change some of the titles to align more with our current organizational structure um, so the changes were mostly administrative in nature. So in terms of next steps for this report, if there comes a time in 2022 where council will enter into a period of restricted acts, our returning officer, Clerk McRobb, will notify council and we will be able to continue operating the municipality efficiently as the authority has been delegated to CAO Thompson. So I can answer any questions. Questions for Quinn. Kind of a housekeeping item, Quinn, to Make sure we're prepared, really. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got a recommendation uh, moved by Council Anderson, second by Council Dirksen. The Council of Town of Middle receives the report CL 2022-02 as information further that the Council consider passing the updated delegation of authority bylaw on open council. Uh, anybody opposed? That is carried. Okay, uh, next up is Annalene. Go ahead, Annalene. 
Thank you very much, Mayor Bridge. I get the last report of this meeting. Um, so this report is in regards to sole source purchasing of electronic document management system. Uh, as you may remember, back in 2015, we brought a Tom Rim system in um, to help us out. And in order to go further and to be able to have additional benefits, we are looking at an electronic document management system. We did apply for and receive funding for this. It's a 75% funding, uh, which is great. Uh, we have looked at many different uh, places that have electronic document management systems, but the proposed file hold electronic document system actually works with Tom Rims, which we already have in place. As you can see, I have listed many different reasons for uh, having this backup in case of disaster, saving time, um, everything else. Um, and again, with the financial considerations, we do have 75% cost and the yearly licensing fee uh, will be incorporated into the 2023 budget and beyond. Okay. Any questions? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. I have a motion. Uh, Moved by Councillor Elliott, second by Councillor McKenzie. The Council receives the report CL 2022-03 regarding sole source purchasing of the electronic document management system. And further, the Council of the Town of Minnow approves the purchasing file holder uh, at electronic document management system from Image Advantage Solutions, Inc. at a cost of $33,740 before HST. Anybody opposed? That is carried. Excellent. Okay. Other businesses disclosed. Um, uh, Ron, you had something. Go ahead. Nope, you're muted, Ron. Right. You're still muted. As as you started at the uh, uh, when we opened council, I was I'm I'm concerned about what's happening in Ukraine also, and I'm sure everybody across Canada is concerned. My question is, and maybe this is to our staff, or uh, um, is there anything we can do to support Ukraine or su support the democracy? Is financial, or, or is there anything that, that a local community can do to, to show their support other than just saying we are? Um, maybe Derek could answer that. Thank you, uh, 3D Mr. Mayor, Councillor Elliott. So, as you know, we we did show some support when we changed the lights to blue and yellow in Harriston this past uh, this past few days. Um, but let me take it back um, with Belinda and maybe our social media. I know there's a number of certified donation sites that are available for people that want to donate for humanitarian efforts in the Ukraine. Um, and maybe we can uh, launch a little bit of a social media campaign to our community. And I know we have a very giving community. So um, if if you let me take that back, Councillor Elliott, I'm sure we could probably put something together. I would sure like that. That would help us an awful lot, Derek. Thanks. Okay. And just on that, uh, Councillor Elliott, as I mentioned before, Federation of Canadian Municipalities has been a big partner with them, and there might be something coming from them. I don't know. There, there was some discussion, um, but we haven't seen anything yet. So that may be another area that we can contribute. Um, Maybe AMO and OSM and, and all the different Western one. Yeah. Well, we'll see. yeah, we'll see. We'll get Derek to look into it and then. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Anybody else got anything before I? I just have one item. Um, and uh, uh, it's just something I'd like to get out to the public. Uh, it's coming up. And we, well, today we saw it with one of our one of reports about a, a lame duck council or whatever. And I just want to let everybody know that I've this will be my 12th year. As, as mayor for the great town of Minto. And I've really, really appreciated all the dedication, both the staff and the three councils that I've been able to uh, serve with. And just saw from today, and I thought, what a, what a great day to have that uh, year in review from economic development to sort of see what you've accomplished and, and what we've accomplished over the last uh, last year and in the last uh, 12 years of what's what's happened in Minto. And I, I feel strongly that, uh, We've had some good councils and we've had some good staff that have really done an excellent job, but I'm getting up there in age. I got more gray hair than anything. And uh, I, I think it's time for me to step back and have a bit of family life. I'm really looking forward to getting
getting down to see my daughter in California more often. She's down in Pasadena. And of course, I've got grandkids here that uh, we want to work with and get up to the cottage and other things. So it's time to me to hang up my hat. And uh, so I won't be running for mayor uh, coming up in the next election. And I wish you as this council a lot of, uh, lot of um, uh, good things to happen going forward. So uh, I don't know uh, anything else. Uh, there'd be a press release. I had Derek do up a press release for me and we'll get that out to, to the press. But, but thank you for all your dedication. Judy. Um, so uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you, Mayor Bridge, for your leadership. And um, three terms is uh, kind of unheard of in these times. And uh, so congratulations on that. And uh, you'll be leaving some pretty big shoes to fill. Thanks, Judy. Thanks. Deputy Mayor Turton. Yes, thank you, Mayor Bridge. I was talking to our mayor on Saturday and I. I, uh, I passed along on behalf of the citizens of the town of Minto. I mean, Mayor Bridge, it's been a, it has been a great run. I know that you'll, uh, you, you know, you look back on the 12 years that you were in and, and uh, as our mayor and, uh, and you'll have some great feelings. And um, again, I mean, big shoes. I agree with uh, Councillor Dirksen and, but uh, you know, um, we just have to look into the future and uh, thank, Thank you for the past. So thank you very much. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Turner. Yeah, thank you. And uh, you're, you're well positioned. You've got a lot. Derek, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. On, on behalf of staff, I just wanted to thank you for all that you do for the, the town of Mento and all your supportive staff. It is very much appreciated. And I know uh, all the staff are going to wish you nothing but the best and enjoy your time with your family. And uh, although I've been here a short time, it's very, very well deserved. So congratulations and enjoy the time with your family. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. All right, well, let's get rolling on this meeting because it was a long one. You guys did pretty good today. <laughs> so uh, any uh, move by Deputy Mayor Turton, second by Councilor Anderson, the committee of the whole convenes into regular council. Anybody opposed? That is carried. Uh, any notices of motion? Not seeing any. That's good. Um, moved by Council. Oh, moved. I moved by Council Dirksen. I need a seconder. If I possibly could get a seconder for that, Deputy Mayor Turton, uh, that the Council of Town of Minto ratifies the motions made in the Committee of the Whole. Anybody opposed? That is carried. Bylaws moved by Council Anderson, second by Council Elliott. The bylaw number 2022-19 being the bylaw to delegate certain powers and duties. To the officers and employees of the town of Middle is read first, second, and third time and passed open council and seal the seal of the corporation. Anybody opposed? That is carried. Moved by Councilor McKenzie, second by Council Dirksen, that the bylaw number 2022 20 to confirm actions of the council of the corporation of the town of Middle respecting a meeting held March 1st, 2022, be read first, second, and third time and passed open council and seal the seal of the corporation. Anybody opposed? That is carried. And this one here, everybody loves this one. Moved by, oh, I need a mover. <laughs> Wants to move this one. Councillor Elliott. Moved by Councillor Elliott, second by Deputy Mayor Turt. And the Council of Town of Middle adjourns to meet again with the call of the mayor. Thank you for another good meeting, everybody, and uh, stay safe. Take care. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Bye. See you, everybody.